tourism team. Together with us, we have Ms. Albache Master, Chief of Party, who will briefly address you before we go with the official part. Uh, technically, just a couple of notes. It's very important that you have the interpretation options, both in Croatian, um, Serbian, and English, whatever you uh, desire, so you can switch the languages. Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Serena promotes itself as the most exciting destination in the world, and it is. Uh, we have wonderful products, experiences, nature. People are welcoming. Food is wonderful. The question is, how do we tell the story? How do we tell the world that we are the best destination to visit? There are many ways, of course. We can use digital media. We can use other sorts of media. But it's not the media. It's the story. What do we tell? When we go to the meeting, what do we tell them? What type of story do we tell? How do we tell the story? How can we, when we communicate, give them the feeling, the spirit of uh, the wonderful country that we have? And today, uh, we have a wonderful uh, expert with us, uh, Alex Krivar, who is well renowned around the world and he's an uh, expert on the region and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course. And uh, he has managed to also uh, invite with them a number of his colleagues to help shape uh, the discussion and uh, how to tell the story. He's one of the best storytellers anywhere in the world. And uh, I would like to turn it back to Ruba to introduce Alex. Ibrahim, thank you very much for a lovely introduction. I wish to thank all the participants uh, for your interest, uh, for uh, participation in this training that we designed together with Alex. Uh, we'll have three parts. Uh, today we are focusing on DMOs. Uh, secondly is the private sector. And the third day uh, we'll have media as participants. We believe that uh, Alex's vast experience and knowledge of Bosnia and Herzegovina would add to storytelling as a good tool and a channel to communicate uh, destination messages. On behalf of our team, I wish you a productive day. And now the floor is um, passed to Alex. Alex. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, um, the introduction, Ibrahim and uh, Ruba. And just Ruba, before you disappear from sight, I just want to make sure that my I'm being heard clearly, am I correct? Am I being heard? Good, hey, Alexander, hello. Um, hey. All super. good, Alex, we can hear you well, thank you. Hey, super. Well, then, um, first of all, hello, and uh, good afternoon for most of you. If you're stateside, good morning. Um, I'll start by saying that anything that sounds bizarre and strange that comes out of my mouth, it's because of the translator, not me. Everything I say is going to be brilliant. No, I'm just kidding. I'm learning in this world just like all of you. So, you know, rather than me sounding like some clever guy, I want to make it clear that the point here is that from the very beginning, that this is a process of learning for all of us. None of us can be experts all the time. It takes a team of people to understand that. So let's just start from the beginning by making sure that you don't think that I think that I'm some clever guy. I am a guy who thinks a lot about tourism. I have thought a lot about the Balkans over the years. And largely my expertise here is because I have a slightly different perspective from many of you listening right now. That perspective will likely be more similar at the end of this. And if we had more than one conversation, you would know everything that I know. So trust me, we've got 
a lot to learn, but <clears throat> none of it is uh, particularly difficult or sophisticated. It just means taking some time. Uh, the other thing that I will say is, um, if I'm not mistaken, Ruba, you will keep an eye on questions as they come up. We will take a little bit of time to answer any questions that anybody uh, sends in through chat at the end of the first half. And then we'll do the same thing for the end of the second half of the, uh, of the, of the presentation of the workshop. And the third thing I've got to say before we even start is I have good and bad news for you. The good news is that Bosnia is exciting. It is fascinating. It is desirable. It is not the most fascinating, nor is it the most exciting, nor is it the most desirable. I know that we say those kinds of things, but we need to be honest with ourselves from the very beginning. It is fascinating, it is desirable, it is exciting, but every country is. The question we have in front of us today over the next, how long is this session? This is 12 hours long, is that how long we're doing this? No, I'm just kidding, three hours today, an hour and a half and then an hour and a half. The question that we have in front of us is what makes Bosnia unique? I would prefer to use the word unique instead of fascinating or desirable. Those are, with all due respect to both Ibrahim and this, this project, those are empty words. Until you've actually done something to make your destination the place you want to share with the rest of the world, those adjectives mean nothing. What we need to do is figure out, and that's the point of this workshop, figure out what makes Bosnia unique, specific to Bosnia. Not more fascinating than another country, but specific to Bosnia. And then how do we share that with the rest of the world in a way that gets people excited and fascinated and desire to take a trip to Bosnia? At the end of the day, let's make sure we know what we're talking about here. We are talking about increasing the interest in Bosnia and Herzegovina based on the stories that we tell so that people get a sense that Bosnia is unique for its own reasons and want to come and find out what those reasons are. That is what we're trying to do here. And the bad news is, no, I'm just kidding. There's no bad news. The extra good news is that we need to do the work that is necessary to do this. We won't do this simply because of a slick marketing campaign. With that, I'm continuing forward in our... Um, I am a journalist. I am a promotion and development specialist, I'll say. I hate words like specialist and expert but I'll use it because we don't really have any other words to describe those things. I think a lot about responsible tourism. I think a lot about sustainability, but sustainability in a real sense, not in the project word sense. Um, I've written for a, a bunch of publications, but I've also been doing this for a long time, nearly 25 years. When you work for this long doing anything, you eventually write for everybody. So trust me, don't be so impressed by the names there that I have in front of me. Can everybody still hear me fine? Don't have, you're the only person I can see. So I'm just, okay, good. Thank you for staying on the screen, Alexander. It, it, it gives me hope. You don't have to, by the way, if you need to go off and do something, you don't, don't feel compelled. Um, and so with that, I'll carry on. The when I open when I open a beer, I'll just if I if I'm obviously... that would be great. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Every every once in a while, I'll just say, "Can everybody hear me?" If somebody could just give me a heads up or whatever. I had a friend recently who gave a lecture, and uh, after he gave a lecture for a while, it became a situation where he was dropped from the call but kept lecturing for an hour. So, you know, if that starts happening, somebody to have the decency to give me a call and say, you fool, we've, uh, we've, already, we've already lost you. Um, the purpose of this workshop 
is the way I figure it, we have uh, a clean slate here to work from. We have basically a clean, a clean place from which to start. Uh, COVID has done a number on all of us. And I know it has done, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of interesting situations have arisen for the recovery of tourism and Bosnia has most definitely shared in that very strange battle that we are now fighting. Um, I hear a beeping in the background. Is somebody trying to get in touch with me um, from the Bosnian side? No? Okay. Uh, or is Alex, somebody- sorry, Alex, sorry to interrupt. I think that the Ruba has uh, spotlighted me. So now people can see me, not you. So can you just spotlight uh, Alex Ruba so everybody can see Alex instead of me just being quiet? I don't mind. You're prettier than I am. I I'm curious, Ruba, do you hear a beeping in the background? Okay, now, the now, it's, now it's okay. Now you're spotlighted. If I'm the only one that hears that ja nečem ništa, sa moje strane je sve u redu. Uh, evo Alex nazad. I don't isto. hear anything. Okay. Uh, it's okay on my side, <laughs> Alex, but to, uh, you're yeah. there in the focus now. Yes. No, maybe if uh, if if it's if the beeping is only in my head, I guess I can live with it. But uh, just making sure that that's where we are. Um, but I hear the beeping also. What is that? I wonder. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's mine. Maybe they're just chats that are coming up. Let's see here. Um, the purpose of this workshop, to get back on track here, is that I we have a if, if the beeping is probably somebody's cell phone on the cause that's being charged and discharged, charged again. All right, well, whoever that is, I don't know, please stop. We're a family now, I can say things like that. Please stop charging your cell phone. I'm even going to turn mine off. And trust me, I'm so important that I need a cell phone on all the time. Um, the purpose of the purpose of this uh, uh, workshop is several fold, but I'm going to start again here from the beginning. COVID has left us in a very strange place. We basically have a chance to start from the beginning, from a clean slate. It has wiped out a lot of tourism across the world, not just Bosnia. So what happens when we fill the vacuum from that situation with COVID? I think we have that opportunity now. Of course, we can see this as a negative thing and it has been negative. But if we do that, then we lose the opportunity of actually getting something accomplished here in the clean slate that we have in front of us. Uh, what do I think we should do in that? That's to take what we have as countries, as destinations, and share them with the world in our own way. I think one of the issues with COVID previously was the fact that the world had basically gone under a similar set of rules for what makes a place attractive and what makes a place uh, popular. Everybody was having to live under the same rules, the same ways that influencers cover our places, the same way that journalists cover our places. Everybody demanded to be satisfied all the time. And what we have learned in this year and a half, two years, getting on three years of COVID is that you don't always get to get, be satisfied by the way things work out in the world. Sometimes things happen in a way that you can't possibly expect. What does that mean? That means that we now need to learn how to be reliant on ourselves. We need to be able to rely on ourselves. That is true sustainability, by the way. Sustainability isn't just a word that we have in a project proposal or recycling your garbage. Sustainability is about taking control of your own situation and not letting foreign rules tell you how you deal with tourism. In this case, sustainability could be anything, but in this case, tourism. So how do we as Bosnia relate to the world as a unique destination? That's what we're trying to, to talk about here. This workshop is for DMOs, 
but it's also for anybody who coordinates tourism, professionals who want to communicate with the media. We're going to go through a whole lot of aspects of tourism and, uh, and, how, and how it relates to DMOs, how it relates to Bosnia, and how it relates to the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, the goals here are to give an overview of what I call travel narrative design, which is to say we're creating stories that are unique to us. We're designing our campaigns and our products based on those narratives, and then we're showing them to the world. This isn't just storytelling. That's a little bit too silly for me. We need to be professionals about this. Storytelling is a part of the package. But when we take that package and give it real critical thinking, none of this happens mystically. We're not going to randomly get successful. It's not going to happen. So if anybody thinks that because a project happens to be in Bosnia, because USAID is in Bosnia, that suddenly success is guaranteed, you're wrong. There's been many projects in Bosnia over the years. We have to figure out how to deal with this ourselves. The fact that there's a project in Bosnia is fantastic. It's, it, it brings hope. However, nothing will succeed until everybody involved here does what they can do to make sure that they are being critically critical thinkers and doing the hard work of making sure that they tell their unique story. No money in the world is going to change the work that needs to be done. I know that's kind of tough love talk, and I'm not trying to be weird about this, but I think that that's just simply the truth. And it's time that folks start their presentations with that instead of ending their presentations with that. It's time for the hard work. And honestly, hard work isn't that much fun for things if you're not passionate about them. You need to be passionate about tourism. If you're not, it's going to feel like work. If you are passionate about tourism, it's going to feel like fun. Because as anybody knows who does work who they, that they enjoy, a day goes by like that if you enjoy it. If it doesn't, you're looking at the clock all day long. So some people may not want to be doing that kind of work, and that's fine too. But just understand that success won't happen unless you actually enjoy the work that needs to be done. Other goals of this workshop, identify story ideas and communicate the destination's unique narrative. Introduce a new lens for seeing tourism and working with industry counterparts. That's travel tourism uh, operators, it's media. It's a whole bunch of people. It's a very wide and varied field. Introduce uh, the vocabulary of travel journalism and methods for engaging writers and media. Again, I know we want to have stories about Bosnia, but honestly, until the hard work has been done to actually create those stories, having stories that just mention Bosnia is not helpful. We need to do the hard work of creating good stories about, about Bosnia that can, then be that can then be shared with the media. Create more insightful and engaging travel products based on community strengths. That may be the single clearest definition of this workshop that I'm going to give today. How do we create more insightful, engaging travel products and then DMOs of campaigns that are based on community strengths, not foreign rules, not, not foreign um, influence telling Bosnia what it should be, but Bosnia telling Bosnia what it should be, finding out what it is that it can do, and then sharing that with the world in a confident, honest way. It's going to take bravery. It's going to take a certain amount of brain power. It's going to take a sense of humor. It's going to take intelligence. But all of those things are, every, are things that people on this phone call all have in, in bucketfuls. And then finally, and maybe not finally, none of these, none of these goals are in, in order of any sort. They just all exist. Hopefully, by coming up with these story ideas, we can help with the focusing of branding and marketing and promotion campaigns that DMOs are responsible for. 
This is a professional course. If anybody wants to speak up during my presentation, please do so. I know from giving many, many presentations to former Yugoslavian uh, high school students and former Yugoslavian gymnasia students over the years, none of you are going to raise your hand and say anything out loud, and that's okay. I just know that there's a level of respect for these kinds of things that Bosnians have that, let's say, for instance, Americans don't. Americans will interrupt anybody anytime, and it's not one of our better traits, to be honest. But I just want to encourage folks, if they have an opinion, if they have something that they want to say, please feel free to say it. You don't even have to agree with the things that I'm saying all the time. I don't want to have an argument publicly, but if you have a difference of opinion, this is a, this is a group that is trying to solve issues and one solution is not going to solve it, just so we're all on the same page here. If a point that I make doesn't fit your situation, think about it in a different way, be innovative. Take what I say, take what from it you think is interesting and throw the rest of it away. The point here is we all need to be critical thinkers. If something is told to you, don't expect that it's the answer. Expect that there is some logic there, take what logic in this case that I give you, understand what it might mean for you, and then change it for your situation. When you do that, you start to become a critical thinker. And that's incredibly important in this process. Um, the structure here today, I'm going to talk on and on and on. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to talk for uh, about an hour and a half here. Um, about what the introduction of storytelling, what it means to incorporate narratives into uh, general promotion and products and development. And then at the end of this, we're going to take a little break, go get your coffee or whatever it is that you need. At this hour, probably for most of you, it will be Rakia. And then I'm going to give an exercise that you're going to do on your own because obviously we're not all there together, but I would suggest you do it. And that is to come up with two ideas based on the stuff that we're going to talk about here that combines narrative into campaigns and products that make your destination proud. Now, again, I know some of these sound like pretty words, but that's a phrase that means a lot to me. Makes your destination proud. If you were to tell your neighbors that you have created a product for people to see Bosnia, would it make them proud of the product that you have created? Or would it be something that they said, okay, please come on, you're just trying to make money off of Bosnia. It's important that you make yourself proud because you are selling your destination. The way you decide to sell your destination has a lot to do with the way that your destination will behave and perform in the future. Um, write down these ideas for the first uh, lesson, the first exercise, and then we will continue to move forward as we go and you can work on them. In lecture two, we'll take a deeper dive into the process of creating stories and also communicating with travel media outlets, which I'm assuming might be one of the more valuable parts of this uh, for many of the DMOs out there. The reason I'm not starting with that is because we as a group are not ready for that yet. I mean, many of you are ready for that. I'm not suggesting that. Obviously, many of you have been doing this for a very long time. You know Bosnia better than I ever will know it, obviously. You know what you do as a DMO better than I will ever know it obviously. But we're not ready to start talking about what we're sharing with the media until we actually get to a point where we talk about what is possible to share to the media. In the second exercise, which comes closer to that goal of sharing with the media, we're going to take the best of those two ideas that we had in the first half and really think about the development of it in a way that you would share with a journalist 
who was communicating with you about stories about your part of Bosnia, about Bosnia in generally, about your municipality, your region, whatever. Uh, and we'll be thinking about these as we move forward in the second half. So you're gonna come up with two at halftime. You're gonna think about it for a little bit. In the second half, you're gonna take one of those two and you're gonna think about how to develop it based on the things that we talk about. So don't just let them sit on the page. Of course, you're welcome to do whatever you want. But in order for this to be as valuable as possible, I would suggest taking the steps and start thinking about this rather than just hearing my voice go on and on and on and on, because even I'm gonna get bored of my voice. Take from this the things that are important and try to work on, be selfish here. Take from this what you need and work on it while we're, while we're moving forward today. So this originally was supposed to be me in person there. I'm in the United States presently, so clearly I can't be there in person. And also with COVID and so forth, uh, we're not taking those chances. So I feel like this has a better opportunity for succeeding by having a bunch of people at home with their notebooks in hand and thinking about this in their own way anyway, personally. But originally we would have done a little introduction session. <clears throat> we're clearly not doing that now. But what I would suggest doing while we're here and talking about introduction is think a minute about who you are. I mean, you can write your name down. If you need to write your name down, then we're in real trouble. But you know, if you wanna write your name down, feel free to. <clears throat> but more importantly, what is your position as you see it for your region, for your municipality, for the country of Bosnia and Herzegovina as a whole? What do you feel like is Bosnia's main magnet as a travel destination? What is the biggest challenge that Bosnia has for, uh, for promotion? Think about these, write these things down, maybe take notes as we go. Again, I'm not trying to be a, a professor here. Uh, if you don't wanna write anything down, that's your business. But in order to get the most out of this, take notes, think about what we're doing here. Be critical of yourself. Think about what you've done in the past. Think about what we can do better in the future. And uh, I'm going to provide my, my contact information at the very end of this uh, workshop today. Feel free to contact me. No strings attached. I'm not going to start charging people if they call me because they want to talk about an idea that they have. Uh, we are in this together. But don't just call me and say, hey, we're beautiful. People should cover us. You're going to have to call with some ideas about what would actually make a good story in your area. Do the work, and then other people will have an easier time promoting you. So what is storytelling with regard to heritage and development and promotion? And I'm going to take a drink. I prefer the word narrative only because... I feel like the word storytelling almost tells, sounds like we're telling fairy tales to our children before they go to sleep, but they're interchangeable. Storytelling and narrative are interchangeable for me. Um, we're not talking about the stories that tour guides tell when they've got a group with them walking down the streets of Sarajevo or Banja Luka or wherever they're, wherever they happen to be. Although that's very important work, don't get me wrong. We're talking about the macro version of story that we're creating from the unique characteristics that a place has, in this case, Bosnia. It's hard work figuring out what is uniquely yours. You have to sit and really think about this. Anybody who has done this successfully can tell you two things. One, it can be frustrating because it is hard work. And number two, they love it. They really take time to try to sit and be, it is their art form. Doesn't have to be your art form, but it is gonna take some work. This isn't gonna just happen through some slick marketing campaign. The slick marketing campaign works when you have the foundation material to actually make it worthwhile. Do you know what happens when you do a slick marketing campaign and you have no substance behind it? People end up coming to that destination. They're disappointed because the slick marketing campaign was not honest. And then they go away and they go home and they tell people that place wasn't worth going to see because they promised a bunch of stuff that we never saw. 
if you develop what it is that you have and you figure out the algorithm necessary to make it unique, then the slick marketing campaign is promoting something that has real value. And then people go home and they tell the, their friends, definitely you need to go to Bosnia. You're not going to believe how much better it was than I could even imagine. The food that I ate, the culture that I saw, the mountains that I hiked, it, it was unlike anything I've seen. So it matters that there is substance here and not just slick marketing campaigns. But again, nothing comes for free. This is going to take some moments of thinking and being creative, being alone, sitting in front of the blank page, as they say, and coming up with ways that your destination can be different than others. A great quote that I love is, inspiration is for amateurs. I know we all want to be inspired, but that inspiration happens because you wake up every day and you sit in front of a blank page frustrated that ideas aren't coming. And when you put in the work, then inspiration comes because you've put in the right kind of thought process that allows the inspiration to come, not just randomly pop there. If inspiration just popped into the air and that was the only way to be successful, very few of us would ever be successful. I'm not a particularly smart, creative, or even innovative guy, but I give this stuff a lot of thought. So many of you out there are a lot smarter about this stuff than I am. I have to do more work than most people because I have to think about how can I succeed? I can only succeed by doing the hard work. It's not going to come easy for me. But the only true sustainability that you can really have, and let me repeat that, the only true sustainability you can really have is when you control your own narrative. You cannot be sustainable until you know your story and tell it to the rest of the world in your way. If somebody else is telling you what your story is, you're not sustainable. And the second thing that I'll say several times today, but it's worth repeating, if you don't achieve sustainability based on your own narrative creation, you will fail eventually. COVID is a great example of this. The world was moving up, 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 up with tourism, but it was based on other people's rules. It was based on the need to have uh, a certain kind of slick influencer campaign happening in every country. It was about having the superficial value of people getting on planes and going to different places around the world. It was about making sure that folks see your destination through marketing campaigns that eventually would bring somebody to your doorstep because everybody was traveling everywhere. Well, what happened with COVID? People couldn't travel. So all those foreign rules of engagement disappeared. What we were left with was what have we done for ourselves to create the narrative that we can share with other people? And the question and the answer was, unless you put in the hard work into creating that narrative, the world changed and we all failed. Trends change, foreign rules change, the industry will change. The question is, what do you have that will exist and succeed no matter what the foreign trend is at the moment? When you can answer that question, then you're sustainable. Until you can answer that question, you are not. It's as simple as that. Full stop. If you don't create your own narrative, you take what you get. If you're not telling the story of Bosnia, then when a journalist comes there and decides that the whole story that they're going to write is going to be about war in Bosnia that happened a generation ago, then that's what you get because they're not gonna see the beauty of Bosnia. They're only gonna to wanna to sell the cheap drama of Bosnia that they know about because they've heard about the war a couple of times, even though they have nothing to do with Bosnia. These journalists don't know anything about the country, but they're gonna go with whatever is the cheap drama. If you don't create your own narrative to share with the world, you get what you get. You get cheap, weird drama 
that other people have decided is the story they're going to sell about your country. For me personally, that's incredibly infuriating that somebody out there would sell a version of your country to other people just so that they can make money for their publication. They don't care what the situation is with your future. They care about what the situation is for the very short-term future of the number of clicks that that publication gets. That to me is incredibly frustrating, infuriating. And I wanna state this for the record, I've unfortunately done that about Bosnia. I, I, I did a story in 2006 for the Washington Post where the lead, the opening of the story talked about the fact that people were just happy during, uh, during a, a concert, uh, during one of the Sarajevo Night, Nights Festival, people were just happy that it was no longer war. I knew when I was writing it that I was playing into the game of making it dramatic. It wasn't until a year or so later when I read back that story and I was embarrassed for myself that I took that route to describe Bosnia. And I told myself, never again. I'll never do that again. War is not my issue. It's not my thing to talk about. I wasn't there during the war. I'm not Bosnian. I don't deserve to talk about it. So let's not let foreign journalists decide what is the right story for Bosnia. I only say that because I'm genuinely embarrassed that I did that now 16 years ago. But I did. And it's what happens, you know. It, when, when people are ignorant to what should be done. So most in tourism think about promotion and so forth with this algorithm. Development plus promotion equals hopeful success. We hope that if we develop something and then promote it, we'll succeed in getting people to visit Bosnia. Sounds logical. I believe that it should at least be this. Development plus promotion based in storytelling equals potential success. That's the, that's the bare minimum of what we should be doing. Most projects, just for folks out there who are not uh, into the project world, typically create something, they develop something, and then they need to, at the usually at the end of a project, promote it quickly to show that they have been working very hard to develop something for a, a place that they have had a project. That's always been an illogical way for me. I've never understood why that is the process that we take. Because what happens is you spend millions of dollars to develop something and then you leave the promotion until the very end and hope that you promote it well enough so that the people who gave you the money for the project are satisfied. That leaves way too much to chance, first of all. And second of all, at the end of the day, the main thing that's important here is that the destination's promotion is successful to show what we have done to do the development in the country. Waiting in the last moment just to, just to promote the country, to, 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 to check off the deliverable box, for me, it's never made sense. But it's the way projects typically work. And I've been on several of them. And I've also worked that way. So I don't want to sound like I'm being clever here. I've also made all of the mistakes that we're talking about here today, I've made. It's the reason that I know about them. So I also wanna make sure that that's clear. I'm not above any of these mistakes. I've made them all. And I'm learning just like all of you. But for me, this is what the equation should be. Storytelling starts this process. We figure out first, what is the story that a destination has to share? And then we, create, then we develop based on that. If you know what it is that you're trying to develop, it's a hell of a lot easier to then develop it. And the great thing about starting with storytelling first is that if you start with storytelling, 
you've automatically created your promotion campaign because you've already done the hard work of telling a story. You're not waiting until the end when all the development and all the money's been spent and all the stuff that needs to be promoted now because all the money was spent for it needs to be promoted. You started with what makes you absolutely unique and you started the storytelling from the beginning so that you then have that that you can also use for your promotion. That becomes the foundation of what you promote. Not the development because you spent a lot of money, but the story of what makes you unique. From my perspective, at that point, success is inevitable. It's not hopeful, it's inevitable. Because if you start with the hard work of storytelling, you will already succeed because you've done the hard work of creating your story. And then you have something to promote that is purely about Bosnia, not about just kneeling down to the foreign trends and you hope that you happen to also get a chance to get lucky. It's just my opinion. You don't have to share it, but this is this is largely the basis of my thinking about tours and promotion right here, this slide. So my approach is, and again, most of you are going to have an issue with this, and I, I, I can't worry about that. I can only tell you what I think. If I ever am with you and you think that I'm just telling you what you want to hear, tell me to shut the fuck up because that's not what we're in the business of doing right now. We're in the business of saying what needs to be done and taking the hard step necessary to succeed. Again, I've talked so much, I need to take a little drink. This is not alcohol, although maybe it should be. Tourists, this is the part that most people are not going to agree with. In my opinion, the reason that you're not going to agree with it is because you have believed all of the hype that you've been hearing from the United States that the customer is always right. I'm here to tell you, as a proud American, that's just not true. Tourists are not the kings and queens of tourism. It's just as simple as that. If you changed everything you did just to please tourists, you will not succeed for very long. COVID's a great example of that. The destination has to be the main actor in this play. Promotion, visitor, and consumer first models hurt tourism and society because they're basing it on the, on the lowest common denominator. And that is begging people to come to your destination so that they can come and spend money. If you, if you make them the most important thing, you will fail eventually. When the trends change that you've based your tourism promotion and, and campaigns on, you'll be left in the cold trying to figure out how to jump on the next train that the next tourism trends have created. My suggestion is step off of that train, create your own train, create the thing that makes you unique. Authenticity, a word that we also use all the time in the project world, is about making locals the most important person in tourism. How does tourism serve your destination instead of your destination serving tourism? That's the ultimate question. When you can figure that out, I know that that's not intuitive. I know that that is, as we say, counterintuitive. That goes against logic. But at the end of the day, not only is it logical, but it's also a great relief because it means that you actually control more of this process than you probably think that you do. Popularity contests are cheap. We all know that pretty girl or boy when we were in high school who was always popular but was dumb as a rock because they were too pretty but not smart. Let's not be that person. Let's be the person who's actually being nerdy about this, figuring out new ways to succeed. Storytelling equals development. 
And the beauty of it is, is once you've created that storytelling, now you have something to give journalists. So now we're getting to the place in this conversation where we can start talking about communicating with journalists because we're talking about the stories that have been created, not just the fact that we need journalists. Everybody needs promotion. Everybody wants to be marketed. I get it. I do too. I also like it when I get promoted. Thank you, by the way, USAID and Bosnia and tourism and everybody who's sitting in the audience right now for watching me. Thank you for the promotion. I appreciate it a lot. But it wouldn't mean shit if I don't say something that has substance and matters. So let's, let's, let's create real stories for ourselves. And the integrated story first process, in my opinion, again, serves the destination first, not the tourist first. It never goes out of date because the heritage that exists in Bosnia has existed in Bosnia for many generations. You have already inherited everything that you will need to succeed from your parents and your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents. I think that the great, the great joke, the great cosmic joke, the great um, uh, what, the great cosmic joke of consumerism and tourism is making destinations feel like they need to uh, buy foreign bought things to make tourists happy. You don't. You already got everything you need. If you didn't spend a single euro a single KM on anything that you'll do, you already have everything you need to succeed right now. The, the phrase that I always use is, you may not think that tourists wanna see your grandmother making bread, they do. Them watching your grandmother make burek is probably one of the highlights of their trip. They don't care about drinking bottled water in a five-star hotel. Honestly, if the only people who can come to a place and enjoy it are people who go to five-star hotels, you don't want them anyway. Yes, you want people to spend money. Yes, you want people to stay in five-star hotels. But the people you really want are the ones that want to see the real Bosnia because that's the story you control. You don't control the marketing of five-star hotels. You control the heritage that you already own. Let me repeat that. You already own everything you need. People want to see your grandmother making bread. Uh, the destination is the most important character. You need to rely on yourself. We all do. I have to rely on myself with what it is that I do. I turn in stories to magazines and publications every week. Every week, I have to turn it in hoping that the editor liked it frightened that the editor liked it, but I still have to do it. And the only way for me to do it is to try to come up with something that I think is original, be brave enough to believe that it is something that somebody will want to read and then providing it. After you've done that, after you've done the hard work of creating this, then you achieve a realness that most only talk about. It's real easy in a project proposal or in a uh, marketing campaign to say, we're real, we're authentic, we're unique. But those are just empty words, unless you actually do the hard work of creating the, the story about your destination that makes you unique. And again, you already have everything you need. It's about putting it into storytelling to make it something that you can then share to the world. The importance of local based storytelling. It can fade. Once you've created that story, you are giving your authentic image to the world. That authentic image to the world drives economic development because only you know what is truly the local information, the local restaurant, the local cafe, the local place that people should visit when they go to Bosnia. So you have in your hands the ability to drive people to the local economy. 
in a way that is singular. It encourages stability because once you take control of your own story, you now are more sustainable. It allows you to control the narrative. It goes beyond foreign trends. And frankly, I think Bosnia is just about one of the most perfect examples of all of this that I've ever known. It is a singular country with singular history with yes, a complicated past, but also a beautiful past and a beautiful country with incredible landscape. The ability to take those things and to put them into a narrative that can be shared with journalists to me is exciting. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating what can be done with Bosnia. Talking about DMOs. So now uh, I'll just stop for one second and ask if anybody has anything that they want to scream, shout, say, ask before we continue to move on. Are we good, gang, as a group? Okay, cool, I'll, I'll move on. D DMOs, thank you, Donev. DMOs are in a unique position themselves. They are something like the managers of tourism. Managers, I meant this to be, I meant this kind of to be a reference to a football. Pretend like they're the coach. They're the, they're the manager of the team. They have, they're the ones who have to connect visitors, operators, and journalists. They have to see the whole picture. They create strategies for work to, that will work for all different players in this, in, this, in this scenario. They have to balance politics and money issues. They have to show alliance to all sides. I mean, this is a lot. DMOs have a lot going on. My question before we even move to the next slide, are you sure you want to do this for a living? Just kidding. But this is an important thing. This is an important position. This is the position that has to coordinate the tourism world. On top of all that, DMOs have to also continually develop the next new success. They almost have to be mind readers for what's happening. They have to take the story that's being, that's being developed about your destination. And I know that I keep saying, forget about foreign influence, but you do need to understand the ways in which you share your information with the rest of the world. My point isn't that you shouldn't care about having a foreign influencer come to your country. That's important. The bigger question is the story that you're giving that foreign influencer. The bigger question is, have you done the work necessary to provide that influencer with the right information so that your destination comes out the way you want it to be? But DMOs have to understand that. They have to understand both the story perspective. They also have to understand what the foreign trends are so that they can combine these two worlds. My larger point here is that I think that the storytelling part of it is more important than the, than the foreign trends part of it, but they're both important and they're both necessary to get the word out to the rest of the world. So the DMOs are under a fair amount of pressure to predict the next strategies, to predict the next ways in which you're going to share Bosnia with the rest of the world. And then they have to convince their stakeholders that they're right. Not everybody is going to agree about the campaigns that you come up with. It's a hard job. It's one of the most important jobs in the whole industry. It's not just somebody who goes to ITB and different fairs around, around the world and says Bosnia is great. It's the person who stands in front of people at ITB and says Bosnia is great. And let me tell you why and actually gives the information that a journalist can then take to their editor. Because let me tell you something, and we're gonna to get to this in a little while, is not just the hard work of coming up with the story. You've gotta come up with the way that you sell your place to a journalist, because that journalist has to then sell that story to their editor. The easier you can make that process for the journalist, the more likely it is that you will get your destination into publications. Yes, there will be occasionally story, occasional stories about Bosnia, no matter what you do. 
But if you want to have well-meaning, intelligent, Bosnia first stories that actually compel readers to come to your destination and to tell their friends to come to Bosnia, you have to do the hard work of figuring out what makes Bosnia special. Create more six. This is this, by the way, is Alexander Donev, who will be our guest speaker in uh, in a little while. Um, we're in the Shar Mountains here. He's taking one of this is one of it's cut off a little bit, but this is one of my all time favorite photographs. Not just because it's Donev taking a photograph, but it's because of just the beauty of standing at the ridge line or sitting at the ridge line here and taking that shot down the ridge line of the Shar Mountains. A lot of storytelling possibility in that right there. Um, so to create more success, again, it's about using what you already have. And this is a question, this kind of gets to the, the questioning of what you're doing now segment of this work, workshop. Uh, I would suggest potentially taking a little bit of, you know, uh, taking a little bit of a step back here for a moment, take a little pressure off of yourself of always having to play the role of Nostradamus or of having to just magically come up with great ideas. And again, getting back to that quote about the fact that um, inspiration is for amateurs. This is not a mystical process. You, as a destination, will come up with good stories because you've done the hard work of figuring out those new stories. But let's go back and think a little bit about what you already have. This isn't going to come out of thin air. Nobody's going to get bonk you on the head and suddenly you're going to have five stories in your head. You're going to have to do, and this is what you should already be doing on your notebook in front of you right now. Thinking about some story ideas about what your destination can offer the rest of the world. What do you have that you're not using most effectively? Right? What are some unique heritage things that your destination has that you can already be putting to use? Do you have a specific kind of food? Do you have wine? Do you have adventure? Do you have a specific kind of culture? Do you have several of these things that you can put together to create products? And yes, it's not just about getting people to walk your heritage route. It's about creating that product so that you can share it with journalists. It's not going to just be about the number of people who you record coming to walk that route. It's going to be about creating something that you have that you can develop and create a campaign so that the rest of the world knows about your region. So there's multiple aspects of, of this. The microcosm, the micro aspect is, okay, I've created a route and only, only 150 people walked it last year. But the macro version of this is, okay, I've created a route and it gave me a great story that I could share with journalists so that they could write about by destination and 150,000 people read that story or, or 1.5 million people read that story. So it's the combination of the two. Let's not just think about the number of people who go through the turnstiles and click a button and say, I'm here in your municipality. We're creating things to share with the world. Um, and when we do this, we have a chance to plan for success in a way that utilizes our own strengths. And when we utilize our own strength, we know that that will last because we're doing something based on what we already have instead of what somebody else has quote unquote given us. Have the foreign rules of tourism made it unrealistic for you to sell your product? If the foreign rules are telling you you should be promoting one thing and that's just not something that your destination does as a strength, then my suggestion is a simple one. Ignore the foreign rules. You are the main destination. You're the main character in this play. Your region is the main character in your play. Your rules are the ones that will succeed. Be innovative. I know that those sound like big words, 
And it will make sense once you start doing it. But you have to be innovative. You have to do it your way. You've got to create a way for other people to see that you're unique and then understand the ways to provide that information to the world. I'm not suggesting figure out your own internet system. You, you're still going to have to work within the confines of world communication. The question is what you communicate. <clears throat> The beauty is, is once you have some success, I'm on this last bullet point here. Once you have some success creating something there, it truly starts to inspire you to want to create more. That first success is one of the harder things that you will do is trying to figure out how to break that code. What is real sustainable tourism? Again, the things I'm about to say here are going to sound like project talk, but it's worth giving logical thought to. Sustainable communities are ones that are empowered to tell their own stories. Who takes that power? You do. The people who are watching this presentation, which, by the way, I feel sorry for you. You must have had something more interesting to do today, but I appreciate the fact that you've come here. Jubilee, don't it? <clears throat> the power of investigating, <laughs> nice. The power of telling your own story is sustainability. A destination is a vehicle for their own heritage. Unique destinations don't ask for other people's permission to tell their own story. They just tell it. If somebody says that they're unique, they probably aren't. That's what, that's what people say when they want to be unique. People who are destinations that are things that are unique, they don't have to say it. They're too busy being unique to have to. It's, it's something like the Tao Te Ching. You know, if you, if you have to put a, a definition on your existence, then you haven't reached Tao. If you have to call yourself unique, then you probably aren't unique. People who are creating unique stories are too busy creating their unique stories to sit around talking about how unique their stories are. So be confident in what you are. People are attracted to confidence. It's kind of like when you're at that party and there's that one person who apparently doesn't give a shit about talking to anybody else. Everybody wants to talk to them, you know, but there's that one person who's desperate to talk to everybody. Nobody wants to let him or her into the group. It's just like, please leave that desperation out of our conversation. People are attracted to, to confidence. Be confident. You already have everything you have. And honestly, even if you're not confident, it ain't going to change. You have what you have. It's what you got. Figure out how to share that. Be confident. Be confident in what you are because it's all you will ever be. Don't worry about what other people's rules are. Be popular for reasons that are because you have figured out why that is. Not because you're trying to win some popularity contest based on rules that you didn't write. If you depend on other people's definitions, I'm gonna repeat what I said earlier, you will eventually always fail because those rules will change and you'll be left in the cold wondering how to figure out the next set of rules. Create your own, just go ahead and bypass that whole process. Create your own rules. Here's the first of our case studies that we will do today. The other case studies will happen in the second half. And I purposely um, uh, scheduled in Donev as the guest speaker in the second half of our uh, workshop here because I want some of this stuff to already have been talked about. Some of the some of the theoretical stuff that I've just communicated, and also the idea of a couple of uh, of case studies here, so that we're all kind of on the same page, and and it becomes more practical rather than just simply uh, than, rather than just simply continuing the, the the theory of saving the case studies until the end. So here's our first case study. Um, it's a route, a cycling route in Slovenia that was created uh, with the uh, support of the Slovenia National Tourism Bureau, the STB, Slovenia Tourism Bureau, Slovenia Tourism Board, excuse me, technically Slovenian Tourist Board. 
I'm going to tell you what it is. And then I'm going to tell you why I think it works. You come up with reasons that you think it works and think about them and start to incorporate some of these ideas into your two good ideas that are your first exercise here today. It is a trail that connects from the top of the country, literally the tip top of the country, Kranskagora, and goes down the western half of the country along the Socha down to the Adriatic, ending near Kopar. It's a seven day route. It goes through several different regions. All of those regions are have their own DMOs and have their own tourism organizations. All seven of them have a couple of things in common. One, they've all been green certified. This route was officially the first route ever in the world that only stopped in green certified destinations. So at the end of each day of cycling, <clears throat> you're sleeping in a destination, a town, a village, a city in some cases, that has been officially certified as green, meaning they have passed the test that they need to get that certification. And it's a long list. Don't have knows this a lot better than I do, but it has a hundred different uh, a different qualifications criteria for becoming green. It's everything from waste management to the way that the destinations treat their workers to the way that they think about the future, not just today, but what they'll be doing in the future to make sure they stay responsible. That's one thing they have in common. Here's the other thing that they have in common that's very important and is very sophisticated. And I'm not even sure that they knew that this is what they were doing. Seven different regions or seven different destinations, seven different municipalities under seven different tourism organizations decided to work together for a common cause. Not to make sure that one destination got all the tourists and that other destinations did not, but knowing that the likelihood that they all had a better chance to succeed by making sure that all of them succeeded by mutually promoting one route, one cycling route for everybody, guaranteed that the whole situation would have more success. That's a very sophisticated philosophy. It's a very sophisticated form of, of travel philosophy. It doesn't sound like it, but it is because most destinations would rather succeed rather than see their neighbors succeed. Because if their neighbor succeeds, it means that, they're, that those people are probably not coming to their destination. So to put that kind of shallow thinking on hold for the betterment of the entire route, very sophisticated. So this route worked with all the seven different destinations, they employed local guides in each of those destinations to make sure that they got the best, des the best route, the best restaurants, the best cafes, the best uh, accommodations. They had professional cartographers come in and make sure that the route was correct. They put them on GPS. They shared it with the world so the world could come and, and cycle between these places. Yes, but... For DMOs, the important part is people were spending the night in these destinations. They were spending money in each of these destinations. They were sleeping in these places. They were eating in these places. They were buying things in these places. They were going to the grocery store, blah, blah, blah. When you do that, you then have something you can share with the world, right? This isn't just a campaign now. This is also something that you can hand to a journalist. And journalists love this shit. You need to make it easy for a journalist to know what they can write about. Journalists are lazy. I can say that because I am one. If you make it easy for them to have a good story, the chances of you being in the press will go up not just 10 times, probably 100 times. I don't even know if I can exaggerate it enough because it is so much higher if you can know how to create these stories 
so that journalists can just turn around and sell it to their editors, the chances of you selling the story goes up however many times you want to say. This story appeared in many magazines. It appeared in Bicycling Magazine, which is a really big magazine in the United States. It appeared in National Geographic. It appeared in Lonely Planet. It was picked up and went viral with several other small publications around the world. Because what happens is other publications want information. They need to sell their publication. So if they see a good idea, like if this appeared in Lonely Planet, other publications read all of the publications because they want to see what their competition is doing. The moment they read about this story, they took this story and they reprinted it in one way or another in a legal way in each of their publications so they could jump on the train. Guess who was the uh, successful party in this campaign? Slovenia, because Slovenia didn't even have to do anything for that secondary viral form of promotion. All they had to do is tell the original story and then get out of the way. This is really important here to, to make a really basic point. One of the reasons that this particular story succeeded is because it's easy to understand. I cannot make that more important. It must be easy to understand. At the end of the day, when I wrote a proposal to an editor about this trail, I had to make it so easy that the editor didn't even question what the, why it was important for me to write this story. It is a trail that connects one place to another place, and along the way, it goes to unique destinations that are all green certified. And along the way, people will get to see a part of Slovenia that they probably didn't know exist. Most people know about Triglav, most people know about Ljubljana, some people know about the Socha Valley, blah, blah, blah. But do they know about all the little villages along the way? So this is a vehicle for me to explain to an editor, here's a chance for them to do that. The story really has already been told, let me put it in your magazine. And guess what? Editors said yes, because why wouldn't they? Super important. Simple, easy to understand, includes multiple places, and also provides a, a view onto a country or a place or a region or a municipality that most people don't know about. Here's the beauty of this. Slovenia is not that much different than, than, than Bosnia. And frankly, Macedonia, if I'm, since Donev is on the call, I might as well say that as well. All three of these countries have incredible mountains. All three of these countries have places that uh, people have heard of and a lot of places that people have not. All three of these places in a way have a small coastline. Uh, Slovenia has 47 kilometers. Bosnia has, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's, 30, let's say, along the along Naum, that area. Macedonia, North Macedonia, excuse me, doesn't have a coastline, but it has one of the biggest lakes in Europe, and it basically is a coastline. And Lake Ochrid is a place that most people have heard of, and it has its own level of attraction for people. So the point here isn't just to say, hey, look how great Slovenia is doing. The point here is to say, look, this is a country that actually shares a lot of the same qualities. They've just decided to tell their own story. And in this case, all three of these countries have the ability to do something that a country with a huge coastline cannot do. They have the chance to be innovative in a way that is sustainable. When you have a huge coastline, oftentimes those destinations don't pay as much attention to being innovative as they could or probably should because they don't have to. People are going to come to a place with a huge coastline no matter what you do. There's positives there, of course, it means that a lot of people will come to your country. There are negatives there too. It means that a lot of people will come to your country and eventually your country's landscape, the fragile thing that, that you're basing your entire tourism on will be in jeopardy at some point. I think we all can imagine the examples here. I'm not gonna even point anybody out. I'd rather point to the positive possibility. So we've got about, I'm gonna give us about, 
10 minutes to go through the next couple of slides, just to give you a little bit of warning. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I'm going to take a 10 minute break for everybody to do what is necessary during that period. Um, and then we'll move on to the second half. We've got about 10 minutes left before we get to that place. So the hard part about doing all the things that I just said in this case study is trusting yourself into knowing that the story that you're telling is the one that you're going to tell. It's easier to go with the philosophy of just doing what you think foreigners want you to do. It takes the brain power out of the situation. But again, as I've said many times now, that will always eventually fail. The hard part is both coming up with the ideas and even harder part is trusting yourself and trusting your own confidence that what you've created is good enough. And again, I haven't run a country like many of you are doing. I haven't run a, a DMO. I haven't run an, a tourism organization, but I have advised many people who do. And I have been involved in this business for most of my adult life, 25 years. I'm not 25 years old, by the way, I'm older than that, but that's most of my adult life, let's say. Uh, and I know that the hard part, because I'm a journalist and I have to send stories in to destinations, uh, excuse me, to magazines, the hard part is trusting what I have just created is good enough so that they don't get back to me in an email and say, what in the hell have you done? This is horrible. We're never using you again. At some point, I have to be brave enough to press send. And trust me, there have been plenty of stories where the editor wrote back and said, you know, good try, but it ain't good enough. You're going to have to do a lot of this over again. So, you know, it ain't all success on my part. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of mixed failure and success. But believing in what you've done also puts you in a situation of working with other people to create these stories. It's super important for you to create these stories. And it's also important for you to have the right partners while you do this. Who are the tourism operators that you work with regularly? They're not part of your firm, but that you work with regularly, that you trust the way their brain works. Lean on them. You don't have to be alone in this process. Who are the journalists that you regularly communicate with? If you don't have a crew of journalists that you regularly communicate with, change that situation immediately. Ask for their advice before you create your stories. And then when you create your story, make sure that they know about it so that they can cover it for their publications. Create a team that you trust and then hold on to them like they are gold. They're very important in this process. The larger purpose of any DMO, let's just be honest about it, is to attract visitors to your destination and enhance the local economy. You're trying to bring money to your destination. The question then, so this is something of a summary of what we've just been talking about, is how. My opinion is the strategy should empower communities to share their inherent strengths with the world. That's, that's the how. Take control of your sustainability by taking control of your narrative. And that narrative is the same as something you already have, the inheritance that you already have. You don't need anybody to tell you what you got. You got it. Now, finding how to communicate that with the world is the hard work. And I, again, I've said it many times. This is going to be hard work. If you succeed, it will be hard work. If you don't succeed, it's not hard work. If you don't, I mean, excuse me, if you don't do the hard work, it doesn't matter. You may succeed, you may not. But if you do the hard work, you will succeed because you'll have stuff that you can use in social media, on your website, to give to journalists, so forth and so on. It also allows you to work with locals to tell their own story. The more you build from the bottom up, from a community-based perspective, and people are proud of the fact that they have been involved in this process, the more sustainable you will be. 
People need to be involved in this and they need to feel proud about what it is that you're offering to the world. The advantage is once you've done these things, you have stories that are already ready for journalism. They're ready to be given to journalists. They're ready to be shared on your website. They're ready for social media campaigns. Um, Self-sufficient promotion equals sustainability. I know I've said this many times. I'm going to say it again because these are important things to me. They may not be for you. If all of this has made your eyes roll and made you want to go to sleep for an hour and a half, feel free to ignore all of it. That's your prerogative. But it's important to understand that this isn't me just performing for a project. This is what I believe, creating unique stories that are strength-based for your communities will create sustainability. And eventually, I truly believe you don't have any other choice anyway, because foreign rules, foreign trends will not always be there. At some point to be sustainable, you will always have to come up with your story. Maybe you've already done that in your destination. If you have, fantastic. Maybe you're partially of the way there. Great. Put in the hard work of getting it there completely. Maybe you haven't done that yet. That's okay too. But do the hard work. Lean on your partners, not your literal business partners, but your the people you hold and trust and use as their counsel for <clears throat> tourism operators, what it is that they can do, what kind of trips that they can lead, the journalists that you talk to so that they can communicate with their editors and get this proce process started. There's no time like now. You don't need to wait for the end of this tourism project to get this stuff going. Get it going today. You don't need to wait for the funding to come in. Get it done today. Start this process now. Go ahead and start writing down a list of people you need to communicate with as your brain trust to go ahead and have your Zoom call next week to communicate about getting it down ideas of potential products and campaigns that you can start working on. So exercise one. And then right after this, we're going to take quick questions. If, if, uh, if Ruba is around, we can go through a few questions so that we don't have to get to all of them at the end. I've already said this several times, so I won't go into it many more times. I'll just say this is your first exercise. Two narrative-based ideas for, it says stories and campaigns, but it should say products and campaigns. But products and stories, as we know now, are interchangeable that you can start working on with the people who you trust in your office or just alone, you know, sit in front of that blank page, do the hard work that's necessary. Enjoy yourself. You know, a big question is here. Do you enjoy what you do? If you don't enjoy what you do, get out of this profession and go become a veterinarian. Whatever it is that you want to do, go become it. But if you enjoy what you do here, enjoy the hard work of improvement because that's the only way to actually succeed. If you don't enjoy what you do, that's gonna feel like work. If you do enjoy what you're gonna do, sometimes it's gonna be frustrating, but you're gonna know it's for a larger meaning. So the two things that this, ask, that this story should bring to the table or the, the many things that this story should bring to the table. Is this bringing together elements of your destination that make you and your neighbors proud? Not just you, but if you were to go to your next door neighbor and say, this is what I've done, this is what I put out to the world, would they say, wow, that's great. That, that's a really a great way to show off Bosnia. Or would they say, what are you doing? Why would you sell us out like that? Ask yourself, ask yourself this question. Can you put in this product something that people haven't heard of before? Some culture, some food, some adventure, something that's unique to what you do. It doesn't have to be. But the more you can think about these different elements, the better chance you have of creating a product that will be unique. Is it something that's new now? Are you having an anniversary? So not all these campaigns will exist forever. But some of these campaigns will. Elements of these campaigns will. Some of them will be very specific. Maybe your destination is having a big anniversary this year. Maybe it's the 100th year since Block. Maybe it's something that you just recently opened, uh, an adventure uh, activity center that people will want to know about that provides the, the hub, the destination focus for a bunch of trails that takes you to different restaurants, that takes you to different 
vineyards. I don't know, but this is for you to figure out. Does it report about your culture, the old culture that you have, the inheritance that you already have? You don't have to ask anybody's advice. Excuse me. You don't have to ask for anybody's permission. You have this. This is yours. Who is your audience? Who are you talking to here? These are questions that an editor asks me when I give a proposal. Who is it you're trying to attract? Is it the middle-aged person who is active, who has money to eat well? Is it the budget traveler who can stay in your place and spend money, but also do it in a way that allows them to stay for a few extra days? Who are you going to work with? Go ahead and write down the names of the tourism operators that who you trust and the journalists that you like to work with. Is it easy to explain? Is your product, your product idea, is it easy to explain? If you were sharing an elevator for a minute with a journalist, could you explain what your idea is so that he or she understood it completely? And then so work with the rest, work with these ideas during this, you know, 10 minute break. And we will take that break after we get a chance to do some questions, if there are any, Ruba, or if anybody who is on the tourism um, channel, is there, are there any questions that we want to talk about right now? I see a whole bunch of chats, but I, I haven't opened it up just so I can stay on focus. Tourism? Um, da, Alex, yes, Alex. Thank you. The participants were very active and they have a couple of questions for you. Now I'll go through them. So first question, do you believe that slow travel could be a trend of use for Bosnia and Herzegovina? Could Bosnia and Herzegovina benefit from this? This is the first. The second question. So we speak in different ways. Do the DMO have to present the story in different ways according to the market they are addressing? So that's the second question. And we have the third one or not? Actually not. So these two questions okay. only. Thank you. Those are good. Those are good. And different, different focuses for DMOs. Um, slow tourism. I mean, look, I, I, slow tourism is a trend, but it's also one that is, in my opinion, is just, you know, I'll, I'll say this the same way that, that, a, that, a, uh, that when I was doing a story about Sarajevo years ago, I went to the market in Sarajevo, it's Markle. At, uh, and, and when I was there, I said some, you know, ridiculous thing that American journalists say, you know, like, oh, is all of this food organic, you know, or whatever it is that I said. And the person, in, you know, the, the vendor there who was selling the food said to me, said, what you Americans call organic, we just call food, you know. So I'm going to answer this slow tourism question in the same way. I would just call that tourism, first of all. And second of all, I would say not only is Bosnia, is this a possibility for Bosnia, Bosnia is a perfect country for this. And it's really great for tourism products also, because the slow tourism, and let's just, you know, that, that's such a trendy thing to say, let's just kind of, let's redefine that for a second. It's not that it's slow tourism, it's that you're creating something that takes a more substantial dive into the culture so that people can really understand what you're doing. For instance, there's two ways to see Mostar. You can either go by in 30 seconds and watch somebody jump off the bridge, or you can stay for two days and actually eat at a few restaurants and understand a little bit more about the history and the beauty of Mostar today. One is mass tourism. And anybody who's been to Mostar and know the way that that feels on an August afternoon in 42 degree heat, standing with another 5,000 people elbow to elbow watching somebody jump off the bridge. It's fascinating and it's cool, but it's a little bit miserable. You're sweating and you don't feel like you've actually gotten a chance to know anything about Mostar. You've just done your Instagram photograph. So Bosnia is a perfect place for slow tourism because what I would prefer to do is go see the person jump from the Mostar Bridge, of course, 
but also stay for a couple of days. You know, go to the place that really produces great Buddha. Go to places that actually you can eat well and to go hike in the mountains around, uh, around Mostar, to go do the kind of slow tourism things that people like to do, but don't often do because the destinations are more concerned with having a bunch of people see their destination superficially and reporting big numbers to their bosses than they are about doing the hard work of making the story of the def of the destination more permanent. It's easy to get people to come in on a bus from Dubrovnik to Mostar to see people jumping from the bridge. It's harder to get people to stay for a few days to understand the beauty of the region. So the slow tourism is not only a good trend and something that Bosnia will do well, it's something that I believe must be done for the longevity, for the permanence, for the sustainability of any country. And again, I think Bosnia is such a great example of this because most of the things in Bosnia are beautiful, complex, complicated, and worth understanding more about. So yes, slow tourism, but I think I would prefer to just call it Bosnian tourism, frankly, because that's what we have. We have that, we already have that. The trend is not going to change the fact that that's what it means to be in Bosnia. What it means to be in Bosnia is not to be on a treadmill, seeing things one at a time and then getting off and leaving. It's about having coffee in a cafe in Bacchashia. It's about hanging out in Mostar for an additional three days. It's about walking and being in the main plots in, in Trebinje. It's about going to, about getting on the river in Banja Luka. It's about actually doing things that are more than just being on a treadmill going through a place. So a great question, but let's, for our purposes, let's replace slow tourism with Bosnian tourism. I think that is more accurate anyway. Um, I, I kind of picked up the question there because I feel like I heard something about the person who was asking the question is English and I'm an American and is there different markets that the DMOs should be thinking about? At, at any rate, I think the question was about should the DMOs be thinking about different markets as opposed to just thinking about one market? You know, again, everybody should have their own opinion about this, but I'm going to give you mine, obviously. And I, the answer is yes and no. I was doing a, uh, a marketing, I was helping with marketing with another country a few years ago, and they were determined to market only to certain countries because they felt like that was their marketplace. And what I said was, I think that that's a mistake because the person that you want to attract the kind of bullseye traveler that you want to attract is kind of the same in a lot of places. The, the, the golden traveler for a lot of people is somebody who's actually kind of like me. They're, they're old enough to have a little bit of money to be able to spend and stay in a destination for a few days. They're active enough to actually want to see multiple aspects of the destination. They want to hike, they want to cycle, they want to walk and do the things that make that destination fun. But at the end of the day, they want to be somewhere with a nice glass of wine in a nice surrounding, hearing about the culture from this place. That more and more is becoming the profile of the kind of golden worldwide traveler. I don't care if you're American, you're English, you're Bosnian, you're Polish, you're Japanese, you're whatever. That, let's say 30 to 60 year old, it could be older and younger, but I'm just giving a huge grouping here, who wants to see the destination, cares enough to do the slow Bosnian travel, wants to be a little bit active, but also wants a nice glass of wine or draft craft beer at the end of the day, is the same more or less across many cultures. Now, is there a difference between English and American travelers? Is there a difference between Bosnian and American travelers, Japanese and American, Russian and Russian and French? Of course, of course. But me personally, if you want my advice right now, I would start with that golden traveler and move out. 
right? And yes, it is up to the DMO to figure out that maybe that French traveler, using cliches here, is more interested in that nice glass of wine. They're, they're still interested in the adventure during the day, but maybe they're slightly more interested in that glass of wine at the end of the day than, let's say, uh, a Japanese traveler might be, who may be more interested in visiting the monuments of that destination who is slightly different than a Spanish traveler or an Italian traveler who may really wanna be on that hike, you know, uh, between different places during the day. Uh, yes, it's the DMO's responsibility to understand those markets and to market in a slightly different way to expand the net that they throw over their possible demographic. That's why it ain't easy being a DMO. That's why I'm saying you need to enjoy this. If you don't enjoy it, you know, go be a, become an accountant. You should become a rap star. You know, whatever it is that you want to do that is your long dream that makes you feel happy when you think of it, go do that. But if it is doing tourism, then you're in the right place. But I would start. So my 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 nickel, my 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 one euro advice here. And again, I'm willing and happy to talk about this in depth sometime in the future with anybody here is start with that golden bullseye and move out. Start with the folks that want to take a deep dive into your destination and have some money to do it and want to see your grandmother making bread and want to drink that local glass of wine at the end of the day and wants to hike, that they don't have to be mountaineers, wants to walk on the trail connecting the different villages. Concentrate on that person first because that person is very similar across all countries and then move out. You got to start somewhere. With that, I would suggest people fill up their coffee mugs or fill up their rakia. Uh, it is here at this moment, 10 after nine, which means it's 10 after three in the afternoon for you. We will meet back here at 20 after three, your time. And I will start within a couple minutes of that. We, we don't have the time for the Akademski Pednis. We're going to have to go through and uh, do it a couple of minutes after we get there. But at three, 20 minutes after three, we start again. So thank you for listening and see you again in about 10 minutes.
Are we here again? Can uh, can people again see my screen and people hear my voice? Don't know if, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, all good. Okay. Super. Sve je super. Eh, super, okay. <clears throat> so, welcome back to the show. I may have to change computers halfway in. I'm noticing that that noise that we were hearing before is my computer trying to um, uh, fuel the battery and for whatever reason not not doing so. So uh, I may have to use somebody else's computer. Um, but we'll deal with that when we need to. Uh, the first thing is to get to back to where we were, which is the story. So now we've gone into the second half of <clears throat> our talk today. And among the things to think about here are how to actually put the different parts. Excuse me for one. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's figure out how to put the story into our our new theory that we have here. Um, <clears throat> story steps. How are we putting the narrative into your destination to do the things necessary to actually create the product or the campaign? Thanks a lot. The product or the campaign that's necessary <clears throat> to put the narrative into action. Again, let's talk about it from the beginning of what it is, because you're basically you're using building blocks. So now from the from the from the break, you had two story ideas that you were working on. Those story ideas <clears throat> were ideas that you will use to both create your tourism product based on the heritage that you already possess, take the different components that you have within that heritage that are uniquely yours, combine them with ways for people to see your destination, taking the time to figure out what is the method people will use, and then creating a larger story that you will then be able to use for the creation of a product, the creation of a campaign, the creation of social media um, posts, the story that you can give in your press releases about your destination, and also the ones that you now have tailor-made, <clears throat> ready to go for a journalist. This is the beauty of it, actually, is that you do need to do the hard work, but once you do, you have something you can use for a lot of stuff. You're thinking about the other thing. You think about the things that make a destination yours, ones that have your strength. Is yours specifically about some cultural items? Is it places that you want to see, monuments and so forth? Is it specific food that comes from where you are? Is it adventure from where you are? I mean, the, the great thing about Bosnia, and the reason I said it's a perfect example, is because unlike most places, it actually has all of these things. I mean, that's a real advantage that Bosnia has over a lot of places. You know, you're not hiking in New York City, right? In Bosnia, you can hike just about anywhere. I mean, if somebody wants adventure plus culture plus food, they've come to the right place. Making sure that folks understand that in some kind of, I hesitate to use the word packaged, but just for the sake of our argument here, let's just say packaged product kind of way that they can then change as their holiday becomes something different is, you know, the task at hand here. What kind of audience do you want? And so, you know, today's traveler, frankly, was built for the Balkans. I mean, I, I would just say, 
Bosnia, but it's not true. It's actually the entire region is just absolutely. <clears throat> People who know me know that I have said this more times than probably is healthy, but this is the era of the Balkans. I think that the limiting factor for the number of tourists that come here is only based on the strength of the stories that we tell, right? And I only include myself in that because I'm not trying to pretend like I grew up in the Balkans or am Bosnian or am Macedonian or anything else. But I do care a lot about the region and I do will likely have my, my wagon, as they say, hitched to this train for, I would say, the rest of my life that's related to tourism. So when we create stories that make the region look and perform better, I feel good about that too. You know, they don't have to be my story ideas, but the idea of promoting the region to the world in a healthy way, not in a superficial way that will come crashing down around us and is not using our resources correctly and is potentially damaging our very fragile resources but in a way that actually gives the region strength so that they are the ones who are in control of the narrative. That, that thing, <clears throat> that aspect, that philosophy is one that I'm completely committed to. Whether it's my clever ideas that actually get put into action or not, I'm just a huge fan of the region. But the reason I'm a big fan of the region is because it suits people like me. And this is the reason why I've always thought that the Bosnia, that Bosnia and the Balkans generally <clears throat> are in a great position to succeed because it is perfect for people who have and a desire to have some level of adventure. They don't have to be big time mountaineers, just some level of adventure, of outdoor adventure, some level of cultural adventure, meaning they don't have to be Bosnian scholars to find it fascinating that so much diversity of culture exists in one country. They don't have to be gourmet experts or, 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 or sommeliers or, or food critics to find food in Bosnia, which is incredibly diverse, interesting. They don't have to have any of those things, but it's a place that allows all of those people to get a certain taste of all of that and bring it together so that they can basically enjoy a trip more than they thought they were going to. And I don't know about y'all, but what I have often found about people who come to the Balkans who have never been there before and have incorrect notions about what it means to be in the Balkans, uh, because of the way that the press has either portrayed the Balkans incorrectly or travel journalists always just write about the war or you name it. I mean, just for all the reasons that we know that people incorrectly portray the Balkans because the Balkans themselves weren't in control of the narrative, but let some foreigner be in control of the narrative. <clears throat> for all of those reasons, we know that people come to this place with an incorrect perception of what they're gonna see. For me personally, <clears throat> that's a slight positive. Not a positive because they have the wrong idea, but it's a positive because almost everybody I've ever met who has come to Bosnia are all incredibly impressed and surprised. And the reason is because they didn't know what to expect. They were completely clueless about what it actually meant to be in Bosnia. So that's a good thing and that's a positive thing. However, I would also argue that that's not necessarily the most positive thing because we have a chance to attract many more people by letting them know what they really can find out when they're here. <clears throat> so again, our stories need to be a desk. They need to think about how to combine those aspects. The stories need to be easy to explain. I know that that's on all of these lists, easy to explain, but it's because it's that important. If it's complicated, an editor who is getting a story pitch from a writer will go right past that email, delete it, and go to the next pitch about Bali or Japan or whatever the next pitch they have in their email. There's got to be a reason that they stick on that email. And part of the reason is because the idea is easy. The hard part is figuring out how to come up with that stuff and then put it into a package that's easily explained. 
As Mark Twain, a famous author in the United States, once said, and I, mean, I know everybody here knows him, but I'm just saying it, just sorry. <clears throat> if you want a 10,000 word story, I can write it for you easy. If you want a 500 word story, it's going to take me a while. Because to take that much information and to put it in such a way that is correct, efficient, easier to read, the hard work that needs to be done there is by the person who's writing the story, not the person who's reading it. So a 500 word story is harder because you've got to do the hard work of editing it down to get it correct and make it easy. Yes, that's going to be frustrating some days. Again, you need to love what you do. If you don't, no big deal. You should go off and be a, a hat maker. Perhaps you could start being a fisherman. There's, we need fish. I love fish. <clears throat> maybe, maybe your family makes rakia particularly well. I'd love to try your rakia. <clears throat> what makes a destination a good host? And pretty soon here in a few slides, I'm going to bring in my friend and uh, an admired colleague of mine, uh, Alexander Donev, because these are subjects that he and I have talked about many, many times over many, many glasses of beer and rakia and everything else. What makes your destination a good host? Now, <clears throat> I know I've said this many times, excuse me for the, the thing in my throat here. I know I've said this many times today, but I'm gonna say it again. You need to be happy first about what it is that you're sharing, not the, not the tourist. The customer is not always right in this case. You are right. Tourism has to serve your destination rather than your destination serving tourism. Be selfish about that. Be proud about that. Have an ego about that, whatever. But your destination is depending on you to have that attitude. If you don't have that attitude, you're selling your destination out to whoever decides they want to buy and that's not okay. It may be okay today because somebody puts a huge hotel there and that's the way people, uh, they'll have a few jobs come in job creation. But unless that hotel fits in with the story of your destination and believes in the story of your destination, eventually that destination, that, that hotel will fail. If it's a foreign owned hotel, you need to make extra sure that they care about your destination and that they believe in the story of your destination. Because the day that they're no longer making profits from that hotel and your destination, they're gone. Those jobs will be gone. The profit that you think you're gonna be getting from that hotel will be gone. So hold people to a high standard for the respect that they show your destination. That includes journalists, that includes yourself. If you don't, you will pay the price. It may not be tomorrow, but it will be eventually. And these projects are important, but these projects leave. Like, I don't know how long Tourism is. It's a few years, whatever, whatever the length of the project is. It's great. We're all thrilled that it's here. I'm thrilled that it's here. Again, thank you for having me. However, when this tourism disappears, everybody on this call is still going to have to do the hard work of creating the stuff that they need to create for this, for this, uh, for their tourism. You know, the people who are here who are foreigners for the project, they're great. They're really smart. They really know what they're doing. However, the moment this project ends, almost everybody on the project who's not Bosnian won't be in Bosnia anymore. They're going other places to other projects. They have other things that they are doing with their lives. They've got other, they've got other, other places that they're going to bring their level of expertise. The people that will be left are the Bosnians. And the people in Bosnia are plenty smart enough to figure this out on their own. This is a nice moment that we all have together while there's a project and some money to give us this kind of little bit of free space to have this conversation, take the pressure off a little bit, but not too much because the project won't solve the problem. We don't want to get addicted to project work. We want to get addicted to being happy about what it is that we're creating. We want to get addicted to our own creation, to our own brain power to knowing that we can solve these problems on our own. Again, project good, us better. I mean, that's the situation here. Uh, when people come to your house, what do you do? You cook the things that you know how to cook well. You know, you ain't gonna cook a damn pizza if what you cook well is burek, you know? And people who are coming to see you, they don't want the pizza. You might cook pizza well too, then cook pizza. But the point is, is don't impress the tourist. 
You find them a place. If somebody comes to your house for dinner, you cook the thing that you cook well. That's why they came over, because they like the way you cook the thing that you cook. You make sure that there's a place for everybody to sit, right? You make them feel like they're comfortable in your home. But you don't change your home. You know, you ain't going to build a new room on for everybody to stay in there that one time. You cook the things you like to cook and that you know how to cook. You make sure that they're comfortable, but they're comfortable in your home. If the only way that they can be comfortable is by visiting McDonald's, then they probably should stay where there are a lot of McDonald's. Don't build a McDonald's so that they can feel comfortable in your place. They're coming for Bosnia. They're not coming for Big Macs. Uh, if they want something different, then let them go somewhere else. And that is a really hard lesson here. And I think one that maybe a lot of people on this call may have to think about a little bit before you either agree or disagree or whatever. But not everybody is for every destination. If somebody doesn't want to come because they respect your destination and to see the things that you do well, I think that the question you need to be asking yourself is, does that person need to be here? Do we care that much about that person? Because there are going to be a lot of people who want what Bosnia has to offer. A lot. And my guess is it's going to be a growing number of people because this is the trend. I said not to base your stuff on foreign trends, but as it turns out, Bosnia's basic personality is what is trendy right now. People want authentic, real, unique destinations, unique experiences. Bosnia is, <laughs> if it's nothing else, it's unique. Um, so who is your audience? Anybody you can convince to come, right? No, definitely not. Though it's counterintuitive, though, again, though it goes against logic, your audience isn't actually your main concern. Your main concern is you, the destination, and the pride you have for your destination. You're the one who must live with how you sell your destination the way you sell it today, the way it gets sold for the next generation, for your children and grandchildren. You set the tone for the way that Bosnia gets seen by the world as a tourism destination now. Once you start down a certain road, it becomes harder. And that's why I said from the beginning, let's take advantage of the fact that we have a clean slate post-COVID. Basically, everybody has a real short memory, and COVID has basically wiped the slate clean for a lot of stuff. Uh, my suggestion is find the things that Bosnia does well and not the things that foreigners tell you you do well. Some people like to go on war tours and they like to go to the war tunnel museum, uh, the, the, the tunnel museum in, in Sarajevo. I'm not making fun or making a judgment. But I will say that when war becomes the focus of a lot of tourism, then that's what you got moving forward. It's very hard to get out of that. So I understand that there's value there. I'm not going to just say bad things about it because I understand people want to know about that history. Just be aware. Bosnia has a lot more going for it for everybody than the random mention about the war that happened 25 years ago. And I'm also not making light of what happened 25 years ago. I know how important it is. And I know how much there is still to say about the situation but it doesn't need to be involved in every aspect of tourism in Bosnia. Just that's my two cents worth, take it or leave it. But as a journalist and as somebody who cares about Bosnia, I'm tired of the first paragraph of almost every story I read about Bosnia saying something about the war when the story itself doesn't have anything to do about war. That is cheap, cheap drama that they're creating to sell magazines, not to do the best thing for Bosnia. So your audience is people who are in your neighborhood, in your community. <clears throat> Be confident about that. Be confident in your storytelling ability. Build it. People are drawn to that. When people, when people start to sell their, their own story confidently, you attract the people who want to come. You attract people who want to come and sit in on the conversation you're having at the party with all the cool kids, not with the ones that are desperate looking for, looking for some kind of, you know, whatever. Uh, I won't even get I won't even get weird about it. With that, it says the word guest, but I'll I'll say it even more specifically. 
uh, <clears throat> I'll give a, a, a short introduction and then I'll have, I'll have Alexander uh, introduce himself a little bit as well. And, uh, and I'll ask Alex a few questions, but Alexander Donev is one of the few people that I know. He's from North Macedonia, grew up in Skopje. He's one of the few people I know who have achieved a status, a very high end status on all three of the different categories that we will be talking about in the next three days. He is an excellent, excellent um, journalist, an excellent photographer, excellent videographer, and a good writer. Uh, he has a tourism operation, Mussedonia, uh, which espouses many of the uh, tenets and philosophies that I've been talking about on and on this morning about. And he's also been at the very high end of the DMO chain, working to promote um, Macedonia a handful of years ago within, uh, within the, the government's uh, ministry, or not ministry of tourism, but the, the agency for, for tourism and promotion. <clears throat> and with that, we have, you know, communicated over the years as friends, as colleagues in a bunch of different ways. So I thought he would be a really good person to break this up a little bit. So you're not just hearing my voice constantly. I'm going to ask him a few questions and I would ask him to expound as you see fit. Uh, Don Ev and I have not um, rehearsed this, but we've talked so many times that we wouldn't have needed to. Uh, and he's not going to give answers that necessarily just agree with the stuff that I say. The point here is to give a different perspective and to have just, you know, a little bit of a different cadence, as we would say. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, while we're sitting here, I'm going to go to the questions that I've asked Donev and start with one to begin. Uh, and that is... Thank you for the introduction, by the way. Well, oh, sure. And why don't you introduce yourself while I scroll through this and get my... And well, get it, my... It, it, you did better than I would do it, so, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, we've been uh, with this, you know, uh, as you said, you know, not a specialist, not an expert, but we've, you know, dealt with these uh, problems for, for quite a while now together. And uh, uh, how can I put it? It's, you know... It's a problem-solving thing when you when you when you're sticking with the problem when you you think about it when you you make the problem your friend you go for a beer together you go for a lunch you you sleep together eventually and such so that's how you solve it. But I also you know I was part of also of the I was the director of the the government agency of promotion and development of tourism of North Macedonia. And, uh, you know, I have failed. I have failed. I, I, you know, I, I wasn't there for so long, you know, my progressive thinking and how I thought tourism should be, you know, handled in, 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 in my home country uh, wasn't recognized. You know, probably, you know, I wanted to do it, you know, right away immediately because I think that we're late with, with a lot of the things that we're doing. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I continued doing what I did also before and worked with uh, different, you know, development projects on different initiatives uh, in Macedonia and in the region also uh, as an advisor, as a consultant, uh, as a partner, as everything. So, you know, tourism is kind of like a lifestyle for me. So I'm glad that that. Uh, we can we can we can discuss about these things and and uh, Alex, I just want to say that I'm also really I think it's it's good to acknowledge acknowledge that what you are doing and that is that you're basically sharing you know your job with us because you know in a way this is what you do but it's a responsible way to 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 educate and to to you know to give us knowledge in the region uh, for something that you know that it, it it's better if we do it on our own so not without your help but we need to learn how to do it uh because this is i agree with everything that you said i'm carefully listening to everything and, and, and it's always and it's always a pleasure to listen to you but also a reminder so i took also some notes that even though we 
we've discussed a lot of these things. You know, there's something that I always find something that I haven't done or could be done better or uh, something that I need to, to, to think about and to approach, uh, you know, from a different side, etc. So, yeah, thank you for, for doing this. Well, I have to say that, you know, probably a decent percentage of this stuff has been directly stolen subconsciously from many of the conversations that I've had with you and, and other people. But, you know, I've had a lot with you over the years. <clears throat> and I appreciate you saying that. But, uh, you know, rather than me taking a victory lap here, I want to say that, um, you know, I get paid to do what we're doing today. I want to make that clear. You know, I, I, I don't want to ever misrepresent. You should. You should. You I mean, should. Absolutely. But I've given a lot of workshops for free too. And part of it is because I kind of can't control myself. I really do want to talk to folks about this. This is something that I am passionate about. I mean, I communicate at length about the idea of people, myself included, empowering themselves by telling their story. That's important to me. And I also say this. I have been covering travel for you know now uh, more than 20 years almost all of it in the balkans so i have certainly covered a lot of other places in the world on other continents and everything like that but my my one constant in my life professionally has been the balkans and so from that perspective i don't say that to sound like an expert what i'm saying is i owe nearly everything that i've ever done to this region like i owe the region but also, but also when you say that you say to to local people like we are when you say you know better than me but i know that you know for the balkans more than most of the people that i know that they live here you know you've traveled a lot you've been in the mountains in the rural areas you've been with me in Macedonian places that, you know, half of my friends haven't went, you know, so this is, I mean, this is, you have a lot of knowledge about the Balkans, so that, that is a big plus here, because you're not just a travel journalist who came here to write a story or something. You know? Well, I appreciate you saying that, and aren't we lucky? I mean, honestly, this is the other thing is, like, how incredibly lucky we are that we all get to do what it is that we're doing, assuming that most of the people on this call do like what they do, and if you don't like what you do, you should probably go start making tuxedos <laughs> or maybe or maybe go, you know, uh, start racing motorcycles. I, I like your, your <laughs> creative ideas. About, you know. <laughs> but well, anyway, like, like tourism is so I think that most of people here would agree, but it's so diverse. It's I, I think it's one of the things that also keeps me doing it, you know, because it's so diverse. You're never bored. You know, right. in, my, in everything that I do, it's, it's, it, I, I don't have any like a similar day, one to the next one, you know, every day it's so different. Every project is different. Every product is different that we are working on, you know, especially now with all the challenges that we have since, you know, as, as you said, you know, COVID washed a lot of the things that we've done previously and also showed us what we need to change. And it's a great, great uh, period where we should, you know, rethink, reevaluate, you know, change the, the, the approach and the perspective that we have. And for sure, I completely agree that, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the trends in tourism, as you said, the, 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 the modern traveler is like made for the Balkans because, Absolutely. you know, so that is our advantage that we have, that it's a huge advantage. But I, I would like also to bring in the conversation, you know, maybe a perspective that I think it's important for the Balkans. And maybe it's not the right time to discuss it a lot, but I think it's important for destination managers and, you know, organization, people from different organizations who are dealing with tourism in the region, just to accept it that it exists. You know, the, the challenge of, you know, working in tourism with the government institutions. Uh, as part of the whole, you know, value chain also in, uh, as the sector, but also with, uh, you know, lack of capacity, because I think that this is something that it's similar, especially for the Western Balkan countries, you know, it's one of my big challenges and one of my, my big frustrations because I've been there, you know, I know what it means. And when you develop an organization, if you're a DMO or somebody who works in this sense, you need here, you need to manage to 
to convince to or to bring people in the same idea in the same narrative uh, from the institutions or government institutions who are treating tourism in who in my experience in the Balkans in most of the cases they don't have a fucking clue what's going on they're either some from some political party who are here just for the party you know just for these three or four years you know and they don't they don't care about tourism at all so this is a big you know thing that we as locals in the Balkans should find a way how to deal with it and what you know I'm not successful I mean I'm trying this is a problem that is a continuous problem and one of the if I can say one of the is it okay that I'm bringing this as a as a absolutely? I, I mean, I, I want your ex, I want your expert. I mean, I have questions, but the questions aren't really that even that important. I want your expertise. So, so as you <clears throat> mentioned before, you know, uh, identifying the right people, you know, the right partners, you know, this, you know, we should do this also in the institutions. You know, uh, bring our voice. Uh, you know, organize together ourselves. You know, uh, convince people. Uh, or work with people that could uh, help us also bring this story also in the in, in our own country, in our own local communities. The, there was once, you know, I think it was somewhere, uh, it, it was in South America, in some of these events. And I was in a workshop with the Minister of Tourism of Colombia. And we were discussing about something like this. And then the, he explains like a new campaign that Colombia is developing for tourism based on music and etc which you know was a very interesting campaign to 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 hear before they started it so my question was you know my question was I'm really interested to hear how how the local communities are you know responding to this do they feel this as mm -hmm. part of themselves you know because this is the only way how you can really promote and organize a destination you know if the local community doesn't live with the product, with something that you communicate, the audience, then it's it's not only it's it's not sustainable, absolutely. But as you explain, also it does a huge damage to the destination. You know, in some researches that I've seen, it, uh, you know, the viral marketing that people will tell their friends that they're just because if you you know sometimes if you promise a lot, you can you can be a good destination. So let's not mix this. You can be a good destination with a really nice, um, you know, tourism product, etc. But if you communicate it and if you promise more than you can deliver, then it doesn't matter that you're good because people will be disappointed because their expectation is bigger. They will always be disappointed, and that makes a damage not only for you as a destination but also to you know to uh, it's a spillover effect. So let me ask you this. This that's a great segue to several of these, and you know, all of these basically have something to do with that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the first one that I I sent you these, but but we never talked about them is you know why is it valuable then for a destination to take the time to discover its own strengths and what makes it unique? I mean, this is basic what we're talking about here about building on its own strengths and about doing what it should do rather than just what the trends are saying that it should do but i mean so let me can i answer this like with, with an example like if you please. if you're trying to, if you're trying to copy something that you've seen somewhere of or the, the the international audience or the the travel experts or somebody's telling you that you need to do it you know that is trendy or something you know uh, what are the chances <laughs> that you're going to do it better than some place that it's authentic for it's known for that you know nothing you know i mean you can you can try you can be good at it but you can never be as good as you know the original place uh, or destination where this was if it was a meal if it was an activity or, or or whatever it is you know so you're destined to fail from the very beginning instead instead of you know working on developing something that you actually leave you know so if you leave something, if you, if, you, if you leave it on a daily basis, or it's in your culture, it's in your heritage, you know, as you wrote somewhere, I remember, you know, it's something that your, you know, uh, ancestors has been, have been perfecting for centuries. So this is something that 
uh, the chances that you are the best in this in the world are huge, you know, because no, even if somebody tries to copy you, they're not going to be as good as you are, you know, or as good as your grandma is cooking the burek, you're, is making the burek, you know, no, nobody can, can make better burek from your grandma or a better rakia from your grandpa or, you know, maybe better chevapchichi than is in Bascharsia. Oh, we can argue on that because, <laughs> but you know, so I mean, so leaving uh, if you actually leave or the local communities are leaving what you are developing as a tourism, as a basis of a tourism product, of course, packed in a way that can be interesting and sold as a tourism product. Uh, but you know, this is this is what makes one destination you know, authentic, original, unique, Cairo, we want to call it sustainable, if you want to, it's part of the, the sustainability, but it's the, the most crucial part, if you ask me. So I think that, you know, destinations should spend time on this, you know, researching, just getting to know, even accepting, you know, some, some, sometimes, you know, the, the best answers are right in front of us, but we cannot see it, you know. Well, we just, I have a I have a question then about that process for you, because as we go into this next section of the of the of the lecture today, we're getting in kind of the practical, the nuts and bolts aspect of this. Uh, one thing that I always suggest to folks, and it's really more because of my background as a writer and knowing what I need to do on a daily basis to create things. But what I often say that is important to budget time now okay budget money whatever but budget time to be creative you know set something on the agenda to gather the people who you who you who you believe to be your trusted i don't want to use the word partner here because that that somehow sounds like business i'm not even talking about business i'm talking about your trusted creative partners the trusted creative uh friends and colleagues in the business who also want to create these things. So how important is it for you to budget time to do this, not just to have it happen in some kind of mystical way, but sit and think about creating, you've created a lot of products in your life. Um, you know, where, where, how important is that? I feel like a lot of folks don't take that time. It's, it's, it's an interesting aspect and, you know, at, at first, you said it. I, I, I re really didn't think about it that way until you explain it now. But uh, you know, for me personally, that I'm talking from my perspective right now is, you know, I I, I kind of live this, you know. So for me, it's like you know, I'm doing this all the time. You know, yeah, it's even when you know it's a continuous process. It's something that it's a lifestyle. You know, it's even when I drink rakia with you or with somebody else so you know it's always my my, my i will also work with my wife you know and even uh, knows sometimes you know she's like it's like 11 at night you know we just kids are sleeping and we're just watching some some movie or something i'm just thinking about that and, and start talking about something connected to this you know to to work to communication to people, ideas, et cetera. And she's like, Alexandra, can you just leave this for tomorrow? <laughs> you know? so, so for me, it's like, you know, I think it's important, but I, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer to this because I'm doing it all the time. And it's something that if you're in, into this, probably you, you are th feeling the same way and you have done this, uh, you know, uh, this time you've spent it for, you know, getting to here you know so you already know you know the people the partners and everybody who can but from what i see now maybe it's important to get a refreshment from time to time you know so just you know challenge you know creative uh, thinking and challenge uh, yourself to maybe just change it, the aspect which it's it's a hard thing to do but I think that travel again, so travel is the answer to that, you know, then you just, you know, visit the place, talk to people, you know, we recently talked about, uh, if you remember, about maybe creating some products where education to, 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 to tourism people, it's included, 
you know, this for me, this is like something very interesting, and very, maybe I haven't seen it before, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, like a fan tour or, you know, or a workshop, you know, it doesn't have to be like something that we already know. It can be a tourism product. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Where people come to see and, you know, they challenge themselves about the way they think because they can be stuck somewhere in North Macedonia or in, in, South, um, in South America or in, or in, or in uh, Japan, you know, stuck with, the, they haven't traveled for a while because of COVID, but also they're stuck with their problems with what they're doing on a daily basis. So they need to challenge themselves, but from a professional standpoint, you know, so maybe think, see how this, uh, you know, a perfect example that you mentioned about Slovenia and their green products and green scheme. That, uh, or, you know, a different place where, you know, they have a different approach on something like that. So I think that uh, spending time also to, to challenge or to reevaluate, rethink your, you know, current or, or past, uh, you know, um, methods of working is also, you know, important for, for, for all of us in, in, in travel, but also in life generally. Yeah, I think having a curious brain, you know, people always say like, oh, he's got a curious brain or she's got a curious brain and they act like it's some kind of definite quality. It's not a definite quality. Everybody's curious, but they're curious about the things that they want to be curious about, right? So yeah. tourism is something that makes you curious. I'm sure that there's many times that Ivan has said, man, I wish Donev was just a, an accountant. <laughs> he would never talk about his accounting sure. every night. You but know. also another thing that I that I also <clears throat> thought about uh, while listening to you, you know, for us here, like I'm talking now us in the Balkans, because, you know, either way we, we, you know, now USA, Bosnia is working as a project in Bosnia with the stakeholders there. And we have different projects in Mont Montenegro, in North Macedonia, and Albania, etc. But for, you know, for some markets, for the overseas markets, you know, uh, we are interesting as a destination as one this they see us as one destination as the yeah, Balkans yeah. you know so we on on you know in a lot of aspects of everything that we do either product development promotion storytelling whatever it is we need to, to work also as a region as, as the Balkans you know so this is something that we should not forget about so you know regional collaboration and uh, working on 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 uh, these issues together is for me it's it's a really important thing that uh, that we are maybe doing but not at the level that it's needed so that's one thing and also another thing is that you know we saw in COVID that you know domestic and regional tourists are very important for the sustainability for the for tourism in general for us you know so don't so advice for everybody don't always think that you know your customers should be you know either always europeans which is good short back travelers you know three or four days etc but they can be also local people you know local people regional people domestic travelers who are you know we can see in the last two years that are really liking what they see they didn't know that it exists you know now Outdoor is becoming even more popular. You know, people are on their bikes, hiking, you know, biking, doing whatever in the, and they see, you know, the awareness is bigger than ever. And it's, and it's rapidly growing on what, how fun and, and uh, can be, you know, ha having a weekend or a week, enjoying, you know, Bosnia, you know, going, you know, just behind your doorstep and exploring what you have here can be so beneficial for the economy, of course, but also for travelers. So, you know, I think that also that is a, a part that we should think about also in, 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 in the story, in de developing on the story, also to, to think about uh, these domestic and regional travelers. I have a, I have a follow-up thought, but I also have a request from you. Uh, if it, are you able to stick around until the end of this? You don't have to, because I know you- No, no I'm here, I'm here. No because there's gonna be some stuff that I, I wouldn't mind if you chimed in on as we go to a couple of ideas that that's the next section here to get, to get into the, the nuts and bolts of it. But, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll do that after I make this comment based on what you just said, is that it's unfortunate, but true that a lot of people don't have uh, high expectations about what 
when they when, before they get to the Balkans. It's not that they have low expectations. They just don't really have expectations. They don't know what to expect. And for me, that's always been a positive with the Balkans. Yeah, that's good. That is good. Because when they get here, they're going to be blown away, right? Because they're not expecting the kind of realness that the Balkans almost always give. Um, but again, <clears throat> rather than even philosophize about that point, I think the important thing is understanding that it exists and then making sure we use it, right? So we have a kind of a double clean slate here. COVID has wiped us all clean. We're all messed up from it. I mean, you know, I didn't work for a long time because nobody was covering travel. And fine, I'm not crying about it. It's just that was life for everybody, everybody on this phone call. No use in crying about it. Got to figure out how to move forward. So we're moving forward. The second thing is, as the nature of things, you know, people have less expectations about what they're going to get in the Balkans. It's not that they have low expectations. They don't have expectations. We can also use that. So let's use both of these things to be a region <clears throat> that not just exceeds expectations, but starts to revolutionize the way that people in travel think about travel products. The world over is used to creating something, doing a slick marketing campaign, getting people there. I think about the Iceland campaign a few years ago, it was 99 euro flights. If you remember correctly on air, what was the, has some funny name. Ryanair or something. Right? No, but it was, it, was, it was actually the Iceland airline. It doesn't matter. But within a year, they had too many, too many tourists in Reykjavik. They actually had to change their philosophy, right? So they took something, exploded it, and then had to move forward because they were starting to hurt this very small place that they're in. Bosnia has a chance to take something most people don't know about or know much about, coming out of COVID, reconstructing a story that is correct about Bosnia, and having it be one of the few places that is small enough, authentic enough, new enough from a perspective of general storytelling and also trendy enough to really be like the shining example in tourism. You know, I'm not, I'm not overstating this like most Americans do when they get all excited. They start using these kind of like best in the world, number one, all that. I'm not even talking about any of that bullshit. I'm just being honest about the fact that we have an opportunity in this window to make Bosnia a place that takes its strengths when the world is regrouping about tourism and happens to also want the kinds of things that, that Bosnia already naturally gives, construct those stories so that they are a leader in the kind of stories that are being told coming forward, instead of just a country that, again, is reacting to the fact that people are coming and we hope a few people will come to Bosnia and Yes, great. We hope people will come and take a trip into the interior of the Western Balkans. It's like, <clears throat> we've got to control it better than that. That's my opinion. Um, and uh, stick with me, Donna, because I, <clears throat> this will come into play on multiple occasions here again. <clears throat> um, here's the excellent news about everything that we were just talking about, is that journalists basically need the same things that DMOs need. They need good stories. Right. And they need stories that DMOs are likely going to be the ones to create. Um, and I don't want to make this sound like we're serving journalists <clears throat> because I am a journalist and I despise the kind of privileged behavior that many travel, travel journalists um, uh, behave. Uh, I really, I, I can't, I can't tell you how little, uh, how, how unimpressed I am with the way most travel journalists, not, not most, many travel journalists act. Like they deserve to be there. Like they deserve to be treated. They deserve to get special treatment. It's not the way I grew up in the industry. I grew up paying for my trips and it made me a better traveler. It meant that when I went somewhere, you could be damn sure I was going to see that place completely because I was spending my own money money that I either had to make a decision about whether I was going to go to Bosnia and North Macedonia or I was going to eat. I mean, those are decisions that I had to make. When you get paid, when everything gets paid for you all the time, you don't have to make those decisions and you don't see something with the same clarity. I'm not suggesting anybody out there go hungry, but I'm just saying if something is worth fighting for, then it's worth fighting for and it's worth making sure that you see it 
with things that mean something to you instead of just being a privileged person who can do it regardless. So I'm not crazy about that, but I will still say, <clears throat> this is the main point of this slide. If you can make it easy for a journalist to sell your story, your chances of your story being sold go up 100 times, 500 times, 1,000 times. I can't put a number behind it because it's that much higher. <clears throat> How do you make it easy for a, a journalist to tell your story? Well, first of all, and a real big one, is you have a story. You know, you're not just saying, uh, I, uh, I live in a beautiful place, and because of that, you as a journalist should want to come cover it. No, that's not going to work. Your place may be fascinating and interesting to you, but you've got to explain why it should be fascinating to somebody else. You, you have to do the hard work. You have to create a story. So <clears throat> journalists have to do the same thing with editors. So if you, wanna, if you want an insight into my life, here it is. I come up with ideas about stories. Sometimes I get lucky enough to work with DMOs who know, who, who know how to help me think about their destination in that way. Sometimes I get lucky enough to know travel operators, tourism operators that, that know how to think on a kind of larger macro level. Often I have to come up with it on my own. <clears throat> I think all three of us could probably understand that if I'm coming up with it on my own, it might be okay, but it probably is going to be ignorant in several levels. I'm not from Bosnia. I didn't grow up in Bosnia. I didn't have to deal with the war. I'm never going to be somebody who is Bosnian. I can't pretend that I am. So that means that I will never understand Bosnia even one millionth as much as anybody on this phone call. So if I have to come up with my idea about what sells Bosnia, it may be okay. And it may even be something that many Bosnians say, okay, the story was fine. You know, it wasn't perfect, but it was okay. But it is never going to be great, frankly, if I'm not able to work with Bosnians who can give me more meat, that can give me more information, that can be better about telling their own story. It's not just about making sure that your story gets told. It's also making sure that people like me don't fuck it up. That's important because the things that I write about Bosnia in the New York Times or National Geographic or whoever else, those are the things that will be in on the web and, and the, in the internet for the rest of our lives. I have one way or another promoted Bosnia. Let's hope for the good. But if it's for the bad, it's going to be there regardless. You know, I remember seeing recently a couple of years ago, and I had a conversation with probably several people who were on this phone call about a bike tour that went through Bosnia. And the headline of the story mentioned landmines. You know, you can only imagine how mad that made me to see that. Of all the things they could have mentioned about that bike tour, how beautiful the, 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 the landscape was, how great the food was, how incredible the people are, how great the cycling is, you name it. The headline of the story mentioned the word landmines. How dare they? You know the person who wrote, wrote that story was not in Bosnia during the war. How dare they write that? But part of the reason that they wrote that was because there was nobody there to give them the story that more accurately portrays Bosnia. So they took the dramatic headline. And by them taking the dramatic headline, people in Bosnia have to live with that story forever. Forever. So the next person who reads that story who was trying to decide whether they would cycle through the Balkans may still decide to cycle through the Balkans. I hope they do. But also cemented in their brain with the word cycle is the word landmines. How dare somebody who is not from Bosnia make that connection for promotion that is permanent? If we want to change the stories, we have to take control of them ourselves. Somebody else controlling the story is not sustainable. It's as simple as that. I have a job as a, as a getting back to the slide off of my <laughs> tirade for a minute. I have a job as a journalist to sell stories to an editor. As one editor explained to me years ago, 
My job as a journalist is to make their life easier. That's what they have to do. How do I get my life made easier so I can give them a story and make their life easier? I get that from the DMOs and the people in the destination because they know the real story, not the story that they're hoping to sell because it believes in the, that it, that it makes the tourist the number one player and the number one character in the play, but because it makes the destination the number one character in the play. If you think this is a nuts and bolts, this is a practical tip here. So write it down if, if you're the kind of person who does this kind of thing. Think about your stories in terms of headlines and leads. When I say leads, I mean like the first paragraph in a story, the first sentence in a story that tells you what this story is about. Often editors want from me to give a very short pitch, a very short proposal, and suggest headlines and leads for the story, right? If you as a DMO can think in headlines and leads, you will have a much better chance of selling that story to a journalist, selling, telling that story to a journalist that he then sells, tells to an editor. For instance, a good lead is not come cycle in Bosnia, they have landmines. That is not a good lead. That's a shitty lead. That's a bad lead all the way around. A good lead would be come to Bosnia where quiet roads, incredible nature, villages you probably have never heard of will welcome you so you can see an entirely new part of Europe. Like I'm taking that story. That's what I'm doing. I'm I'm, I'm booking my ticket tomorrow for that story. And not only am I, I have done that. I have booked my own ticket to Bosnia to do that many times. So <clears throat> think in terms of how it is that you can help the journalists to tell their story and helping them does not include saying, Bosnia is great and we're beautiful, you should do a story. Editors don't wanna hear that. Editors are not gonna give a writer a story because they said Bosnia, I've heard that Bosnia was beautiful and great. We should do a story about it. They ain't going to give you that story. The first thing an editor is going to do is they're going to say, why are we doing this story now? Like, wh why? Why am I going to Bosnia? What's the purpose? Well, we're going to Bosnia because a new, a new route was just opened that includes wine, food, and cycling. A new route was just opened that goes uh, along the Vrbar River, uh, goes, goes along... Go, that goes all the rivers in Bosnia, you know, that goes to all the different places that you can go and, uh, and eat and see nature. A new route, route was opened that goes from place to place in different municipalities, buying only uh, homemade product in Bihać, uh, Brčko, uh, Banja Luka, Sarajevo, Mostar, and, and Trebinje. I mean, coming up with the reason that you can launch the region, the destinations and municipalities and the municipalities having enough bravery to tell their own story and to do it together. That's the reason that people will come and write stories about Bosnia. It's not gonna be because we think it's great. Nobody's gonna, everybody thinks that they're great. Everybody thinks that they're pretty. Everybody thinks that they have a good sense of humor and dress well and are funny at parties, but you know, they just aren't. <laughs> so we need to write stories about why it is that we do those things correctly. Uh, and, you know, so an editor asked me, why do we do it now? Is this idea easily explained? Does it add a new element to the conversation about Europe, about Bosnia? Is it simple connections between culture and adventure so that my readers, my travelers will want to do this? What you as a DMO would ask is, is this, is this something that would make me proud? if this is what's written about in a paper, is this something that the, the headline of this story is something that I want to share with people without feeling like, oh shit, they did it again. It's a story about war in Bosnia. You know, we're, we're, we're ready to get past it, but it's just another one of those stories. Does it portray your culture and your environment correctly? <clears throat> I've been getting at this over and over, but I'll say it again, uh, journalists of which I am one of them are often lazy. They're not lazy because they don't work hard but they would love to get a good story idea. As soon as they can get a good story idea, they're gonna pitch it. If you're the one who gives them that story idea, then you have a better chance of getting your story and your region and your area published. And if you have a chance to get your region published, 
you have a larger chance of having more people visit your region. If you have a larger chance of getting your region visited, then you are bringing money into your economy, which in the end, let's just get to the point, that's what DMOs are supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be filling beds and filling restaurants with people who want to come visit your region. If you didn't have that as a responsibility, there'd be no point in having that as a role. So that's what you're doing. Find, come up with these story ideas that we've been talking about and go ahead and get them ready so that you can give those three paragraph, easy to read, press release type documents ready for journalists so that they don't have to do the hard work of coming up with their own ignorant stories on their own. They can do the good work of having an expert like you tell them the right story to tell. And then you also get the chance to have your story told correctly in the way that you want it to be told. This is a story that Donev's in there, I'm in there, a handful of other people in there. Um, we were in, uh, we were in uh, Macedonia a handful of years ago, uh, uh, scouting the route for uh, the Via Donatica. I'm guessing this is 2016? 2015, I think. 2015. <clears throat> this is a uh, very- it's the first, the first, the first hut in, in uh, on the Shadow Mountains in in North Macedonia, and there's a really good example of of who's here right now. So, Donev, we're all literally wearing party hats, but Donev has wearing multiple hats because he's both our DMO largely, but he also was a tourism operator and knew this place well. There's a whole handful of journalists here, photographers, and uh, I'm there, and uh, and other tourism operators. And, you know, this is, you know, we, we'd obviously been having fun, but these are all people who are really passionate about tourism. So it's really easy to talk about good ideas when everybody's having drinks and talking about something that they're passionate about, especially when you're in the moment. My suggestion is for the, the DMOs out there, gather the people that you find important in your life, hold on to them like they're gold and take them to a place. I think don't have actually brought this up. Take them to, to some place in your region. You have some kind of getaway, have a meal and don't put so much pressure on yourself, but come up with ideas about good story ideas that you want to um, tell to the world. Take a journalist with you so that they can talk about the things that they need to do when they share these things with, with editors. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go through a couple of case studies here quickly uh, just to give you some idea. We've got Technically, we have five minutes until this is over. I think we're probably going to run a few minutes over. Um, and anybody who can't stay, obviously, you know, go go start your new careers as hat makers and and uh, and and train conductors or whatever it is that you're going to do. Um, <clears throat> this is a story idea that I did a few years ago for the Times. It's about juke joints are old blues music venues where people play music in the American South. Each of these alone are pretty cool, but none of these alone work very well. The way that they have worked well is they've become a route, a, 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 a trail of these different places where you can go and watch old, old blues music in its kind of original form. Um, <clears throat> it's a great route. And it's a great example of taking something that they do really well and packaging it and giving it to the public. Old blues music is something that people do in the South extremely well. If they can put it together to make a product out of it so that several places, and there was three or four states that I went to, it was like Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, blah, blah, blah. And you know those, as a group, they become very powerful. One-on-one, -on -one, you know, they're struggling. Um, <clears throat> Here's a video, and I hesitate. I'm, I'm going to play this video. Ruba, can I run over a few minutes? Ruba, are you there? Well, I'm going to go ahead and run over a few minutes because I want to show this. I'm, I'm going to explain this, and then I'm going to get to the last slide. And then um, don't have one of the reasons I wanted you to stick around is because we'll be talking about the Via Donatica just slightly, and you're welcome to chime in as you choose. You don't have to chime in if you don't want to. But <clears throat> this this is about a three or four minute video, so be aware of that. But it's important to me, this video. And it's not just because it's my voice. This is another route. And I know that I'm showing a lot of Slovenian thing, but the reason I'm showing Slovenia 
isn't because I'm trying to promote Slovenia. It's because I think that there are so many similarities here that I want to give ideas of what we're doing. And not everything that you do as a destination for your product needs to be adventure-based. But I particularly like routes, trails, because you incorporate multiple municipalities, multiple communities in one trail. Everybody gets lifted up. There's not, a, there's not so much pressure on each one, but there's the expanded, relaxed pressure across the whole group. And then the whole group can provide some diversity. It also keeps people in the region longer, right? So if you have seven places that you go to, you're guaranteed that people will be in that region for seven days, for instance. And they learn, and sorry, amigo, and they learn, how to, and they learn how to collaborate. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah. They learn how to work together. And grab partners that you like and enjoy and want to work with in the future. So, and then you have success with one route. It's easier to have successes with others. So I understand that these are adventure based, the ones I'm about to show you, so forth and so on. But it just happens to be that the Balkans are perfect for adventure and culture. You know, if I was in New York City, there would be no adventure here. It would be whatever New York does. In the Balkans, it's adventure plus culture plus food, which to me is, you know, my sweet spot. So in this one, the gourmet route is the, is the Slovenia Green Gourmet Route is a route that goes across the country. It highlights places where you can drink or eat well. That's what each of the highlights of the stage endings are. And it coordinates it across 11 different communities. So imagine that coordination. This is even different than the earlier one. I'm going to put this on and then I'm going to come back and we're going to finish up as this ends. We're going to be a few minutes late. I'm sorry to that to everybody who is who needs to get away. If you need to get away, please do so. I'm starting it now and here we go. Don't have can you hear that? Give me a green gourmet route. Alex, we can't hear anything. Alex. Alex, you need to unmute yourself. Otherwise, we cannot hear the video. It's a rolling tour across diverse landscapes. Wine. I'm going to shorten share. this video, but then it's going to take us to where we were. I collect the young cheese and uh, I age them and uh, take care of them for close to 40 years. The Slovenia Green Gourmet Route builds bridges between communities, delicious food, and offers everyone to travel in a sustainable way. So everyone can discover this beautiful country on two wheels. Slovenia is first very small and very different. Every 50 kilometers you have a different uh, situation, uh, nature, different climates, different even dialects and people. We have one language, but uh, two million of people, we have uh, 46 dialect, dialects. <laughs> I think that uh, the greatest thing of our region is not just the local products and all the other 
activities that we developed in the last past years, like uh, hiking and biking, but the force of our region are our people. The route which takes cyclists through the Socha Valley, Gorishka Burga, the Vipava Valley, the Karst region, Ljubljana, and along the Sava and Drava rivers is a rolling tour across diverse landscapes, historic sites, incredible scenery, and through vineyards where you can earn your wine with your effort on the saddle. So our tourist destination is small, uh, only about 40 different tourism service providers. And the importance of them working together is great because as an individual, they're not strong, but as a whole, we are strong. So that means that we have to work together. We have to communicate and all of the destination has to work as one synchronous unit. The Slovenia Green Gourmet Route is also the perfect place to learn more about the country where Tour de France and Olympic cycling legends are born and a trail that takes you deeper into the natural conditions that make this one of the best cycle touring destinations in Europe and indeed the world. Yeah, you have the Alps, you have the seaside, you have the Canonian side, you have the inner side. Natural Park Natura 2000. Uh, every traveler is going to find uh, a real chocolate experience and satisfy all their senses. So, get your gear together, download the maps, prepare your palette, and hop on your bike to ride the Slovenia Green Gourmet Route, where your experiences from appetizer to entree to dessert are already served up and waiting for you. You'll just need to earn them with your legs, your appetite, and your imagination. So, the larger point here, I believe, is you could replace the word Slovenia with Bosnia at any point in that video. I mean, the, the, the conditions that make it good to do that are exactly the conditions that make Bosnia good. All the way down to really the, the population number and you know a few other factors. Slovenia is a little bit smaller. Uh, Slovenia has uh, you know one extra mountain range, but Slovenia also doesn't have the same mountains that Bosnia does. Bosnia's mountains are you know, arguably as good as any place on the planet, especially given how many of them there are. <clears throat> so, I mean, you know, again, it's not so much about, it's not so much about Slovenia being particularly good at what they're doing. What they are, uh, what they've done is they've taken what they, what they have and they've created stories out of it. But, you know, Bo Bosnia could have done exactly the same thing. <clears throat> we had, uh, this is also a shot from North Macedonia. Um, years ago. I'm going to finish up with these last couple slides and get some questions from folks. Uh, I want to again say that the reason that this story worked, and I'm guessing that many of the people on this call today are aware of the Via Donatica. If you're not, of course, it's a long distance hiking route that connects all the countries of the Western Balkans. Um, and we worked on it a lot for the last decade. 
um, really starting in around 2007, 2008. And then in 2009, it was a, a small pilot project that eventually became a larger project in 2013 that eventually became a big promotion that we did over the next few years through 2014, 15, 16, 17, until this day. Uh, it was picked up you know, by hundreds of magazines. Why is the question. The question is because it's an easy story to tell. And I'm telling you this, not because I want to re-educate you about the Via Donatica, because most people on this call probably know something, something about it but because it fulfills all the criteria for a good story. It's easy to tell, starts in one place, ends in another. Along the way, you see culture and food and heritage and mountains that probably most folks haven't seen. Easy story to tell. But it also works because it is at its core a community-based product where small communities and small villages have a chance to be heard. That in and of itself makes it a supreme product. It also works well because it perfectly shows off the Balkans in all of its power. Real tourism, real adventure, real food, real people excited that folks are coming to visit their villages where they probably had never really thought that there would be any good tourism. But there are, because there's reason to come there, because a product, a campaign, and a story was being told. I have two more videos. I'm not going to show them because we have stuff to do. But I will give this. We have the final, um, the final uh, exercise that I would... Uh, encourage you to take some time and to do for yourself. You know, you don't have to do it for me. There's no test here. I'm not, I'm not testing you on how well you listened. I'm assuming that you probably fell asleep for at least part of it. I would have. But if any of it inspired you, I would encourage you to, 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 to take this last exercise. Come up with the best of the two ideas that you had previously. Of those two, take one that you think is really a good idea. And then put it to the test of the things that we've been talking about. Is it simple and easy to explain? Does it encourage community pride? Which, who, what kind of tourism operators, journalists, are you going to work with to make it better? You may come up with the idea on your own, but you're going to need somebody to put it into action. Unless you're also a tourism operator, you're gonna have to talk to tourism operators to put this product into action. And then for everybody's sake, the destination, the tourism operators, yours and the country's sake, you're going to have to figure out a way to make that story easier to tell for journalists. Think about the headlines. Think about the first paragraph, what it explains about the place where you are. How are you going to communicate with those journalists? So generally speaking, we came and talked about what the idea of narrative design is. We then identified ways, story ideas, and some things that we can think about to put those story ideas into action. Introduce that as a new way to see tourism and to develop what it is that you're doing so that you can better portray your destination to the world. Talking about how to communicate with travel journalists, to create better products based on that, and to come up with campaigns. Once you have some success with one of these campaigns, trust me, you'll want to do more. It becomes addictive. You want to take the success that you had from being creative and create better and better campaigns. So please start that process. Um, and again, my website is here, but my email address is prominent on that. You don't need to search much for it. I encourage people to ask questions. If there's something that you didn't understand, if there's something you want some more explanation about, 
if there's just an idea, I'm, I also would like to learn. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people here with a heck of a lot more expertise than I do about a lot of things. <clears throat> you know, I'm doing my best to try to communicate what I know. Feel free to communicate what you know so that I can also learn and be, you know, more valuable to the journey here for the region and for the country. Um, Don't have thanks a ton, man. I really appreciate you being a, 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 a friendly supporter during this process, but also lending your expertise. It makes it a lot better for me. It's always a pleasure, Alex. Thank you, man. And, and thank you for, you know, for, for, you know, this is, this is so refreshing. I can, I think it's a time for a master class. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, at least we should all be doing it next time in person. We should, we should think about something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you and I will produce that in a different time. Is there any is there any questions, Ruba, that we can uh, answer and and uh, and make everybody's life just a hundred percent better? Yeah, Alex, uh, Ruba had to leave us uh, for because she had another meeting. As I could see, we had only one question. And okay. the question is if uh, they could get your email, if they can send you their stories uh, for you to comment and review them. The answer is yes. And, and on the screen at the moment is, uh, is, my, is my web address. And I, I, I only didn't give my email address, not because I'm hiding it, but, but this is an easier way to do it. If you go to that and look under contact or about or whatever the whatever the the, the menu item is there, uh, my my email is prominent, so you don't have to search very hard. And the answer is yes. I mean, I'm I'm in this not just as a consultant. I'm in this as somebody who wants to. I'll be honest. One of it is because I want to um, uh, help make the region better with tourism. But if I'm being honest, it's also selfish. Right, because the better tourism is in the Balkans, it probably means the more work I'll get as a journalist to be able to cover new stories. So part of me wants to make it better because I like the idea of communicating uh, this stuff with people. But part of it is because I know that the better it is, the better it will be for all of us to cover it, to attract people, to increase the number of people who come to the region. So, you know, the short answer is, Yes, of course. That's the whole point of this, is that for us to become colleagues as opposed to me just being some clever dude sitting on the end of a camera talking like he knows what he's talking about. This is only going to work when we all work together to think and to do the brain work and to be teammates. Um, so, yes. And I really appreciate this chance to speak to everyone. Um, you know, I'll be doing this for the next two days. Tomorrow will be about tourism operators. There'll be a lot of overlap to what we just talked about here, but it will be, it will have some very specific um, tourism operator um, focus as well, but there will be a lot of overlap. And then the next day on Friday is media uh, talking about travel journalism and uh, what it means to be a travel journalist. And hopefully I can provide some insight for folks who are interested in being a travel journalist but also the travel journalism, the media um, lesson, lecture, workshop, whatever we want to call it, uh, is valuable for folks who are just in the business because it's important to know what your counterparts do so that you can know how better to communicate with them. The better you understand the, the process that a journalist needs to go through to get a story about your region published, the better you have a chance to communicate the right things to him or her to actually get that accomplished. So having said that, again, Monsieur Donev, merci. To everybody here, I really appreciate your time, your interest, and um, to the interpreters, I'm sorry if my Southern accent became too hard to understand and, uh, and for talking much longer than we originally had planned, but 15 minutes by anybody who knows me knows that ain't much. We did pretty good. Um, thanks again. And uh, hopefully see everybody tomorrow or the next day or down the road next time I'm in Bosnia. Ciao. And thank you very much. Have a great evening.
stay out of trouble, stay out of jail. Thank you all for being with us and goodbye.